Part One of Bernice Bobs Her Hair. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Bernice Bobs Her Hair by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part One. After dark on Saturday night, one could stand on the first tee of the golf course and see the country club windows as a yellow expanse over a very black and wavy ocean. The waves of this ocean, so to speak, were the heads of many curious caddies, a few of the more ingenious chauffeurs, the golf professional's deaf sister, and there were usually several stray, diffident waves who might have rolled inside had they so desired. This was the gallery. The balcony was inside. It consisted of the circle of wicker chairs that lined the wall of the combination club room and ballroom. At these Saturday night dances it was largely feminine, a great babble of middle-aged ladies, with sharp eyes and icy hearts, behind lorgnettes and large bosoms. The main function of the balcony was critical. It occasionally showed grudging admiration, but never approval, for it is well known among ladies over thirty-five that when the younger set dance in the summertime it is with the very worst intentions in the world and if they are not bombarded with stony eyes stray couples will dance weird barbaric interludes in the corners and the more popular more dangerous girls will sometimes be kissed in the parked limousines of unsuspecting dowagers but after all this critical circle is not close enough to the stage to see the actors faces and catch the subtler by-play it can only frown and lean ask questions and make satisfactory deductions from its set of postulates such is the one which states that every young man with a large income leads the life of a hunted partridge. It never really appreciates the drama of the shifting, semi-cruel world of adolescence. No, boxes, orchestra circle, principals, and chorus are represented by the medley of faces and voices that sway to the plaintive African rhythm of Dyer's Dance Orchestra. From sixteen-year-old Otis Ormond, who has two more years at Hill School, to G. Rees Stoddard, over whose bureau at home hangs a Harvard Law Diploma, from little Madeline Hoag, whose hair still feels strange and uncomfortable on top of her head, to Bessie McRae, who has been the life of the party a little too long, more than ten years. The medley is not only the center of the stage, but contains the only people capable of getting an unobstructed view of it. With a flourish and a bang, the music stops. The couples exchange artificial, effortless smiles, facetiously repeat, la-di-da-da, dum-dum, and then the clatter of young feminine voices soars over the burst of clapping. A few disappointed stags, caught in mid-floor as they had been about to cut in, subsided listlessly back to the walls, because this was not like the riotous Christmas dances. These summer hops were considered just pleasantly warm and exciting, where even the younger marrieds rose and performed ancient waltzes and terrifying fox-trots to the tolerant amusement of their younger brothers and sisters. Warren McIntyre, who casually attended Yale, being one of the unfortunate stags, felt in his dinner-coat pocket for a cigarette and strolled out onto the wide, semi-dark veranda, where couples were scattered at tables, filling the lantern-hung night with vague words and hazy laughter. He nodded here and there at the less absorbed, and as he passed each couple, some half-forgotten fragment of a story played in his mind, for it was not a large city, and every one was who's who to every one else's past. There, for example, were Jim Strain and Ethel de Marist, who had been privately engaged for three years. Everyone knew that as soon as Jim managed to hold a job for more than two months, she would marry him. Yet how bored they both looked, and how wearily Ethel regarded Jim sometimes, as if she wondered why she had trained the vines of her affection on such a wind-shaken poplar. Warren was nineteen and rather pitying with those of his friends who hadn't gone east to college. But like most boys, he bragged tremendously about the girls of his city when he was away from it. There was Genevieve Ormond, who regularly made the rounds of dances, house parties, and football games at Princeton, Yale, Williams, and Cornell. There was black-eyed Roberta Dillon, who was quite as famous to her own generation as Hiram Johnson or Ty Cobb. And, of course, there was Marjorie Harvey, who, besides having a fairy-like face and a dazzling, bewildering tongue, 
was already justly celebrated for having turned five cartwheels in succession during the last pump-and-slipper dance at New Haven. Warren, who had grown up across the street from Marjorie, had long been crazy about her. Sometimes she seemed to reciprocate his feeling with a faint gratitude, but she had tried him by her infallible test and informed him gravely that she did not love him. Her test was that when she was away from him, she forgot him and had affairs with other boys. Warren found this discouraging, especially as Marjorie had been making little trips all summer, and for the first two or three days after each arrival home, he saw great heaps of mail on the Harvey's hall table, addressed to her in various masculine handwritings. To make matters worse, all during the month of August, she had been visited by her cousin Bernice from Eau Claire, and it seemed impossible to see her alone. It was always necessary to hunt round and find someone to take care of Bernice. As August waned, this was becoming more and more difficult. Much as Warren worshipped Marjorie, he had to admit that Cousin Bernice was sort of dopeless. She was pretty, with dark hair and high color, but she was no fun on a party. Every Saturday night he danced a long, arduous duty dance with her to please Marjorie, but he had never been anything but bored in her company. Warren, a soft voice at his elbow, broke in upon his thoughts, and he turned to see Marjorie, flushed and radiant as usual. She laid a hand on his shoulder, and a glow settled almost imperceptibly over him. Warren, she whispered, do something for me. Dance with Bernice. She's been stuck with little Otis Ormond for almost an hour. Warren's glow faded. Why, sure, he answered half-heartedly. You don't mind, do you? I'll see that you don't get stuck. It's all right. Marjorie smiled. That smile was thanks enough. You're an angel, and I'm obliged to loads. With a sigh, the angel glanced round the veranda, but Bernice and Otis were not in sight. He wandered back inside, and there in front of the women's dressing room he found Otis in the center of a group of young men who were convulsed with laughter. Otis was brandishing a piece of timber he had picked up, and discoursing volubly. "'She's gone in to fix her hair,' he announced wildly. "'I'm waiting to dance another hour with her.' Their laughter was renewed. "'Why don't some of you cut in?' cried Otis resentfully. "'She likes more variety.' "'Why, Otis,' suggested a friend, "'you've just barely got used to her.' "'Why the two-by-four, Otis?' inquired Warren, smiling. The two by four? Oh, this. This is a club. When she comes out, I'll hit her on the head and knock her in again. Warren collapsed on a settee and howled with glee. Never mind, Otis, he articulated finally. I'm relieving you this time. Otis simulated a sudden fainting attack and handed the stick to Warren. If you need it, old man, he said hoarsely. No matter how beautiful or brilliant a girl may be, the reputation of not being frequently cut in on makes her position at a dance unfortunate. Perhaps boys prefer her company to that of the butterflies with whom they dance a dozen times an evening, but youth in this jazz-nourished generation is temperamentally restless, and the idea of fox-trotting more than one full fox-trot with the same girl is distasteful, not to say odious. When it comes to several dances and the intermissions between, she can be quite sure that a young man, once relieved, will never tread on her wayward toes again. Warren danced the next full dance with Bernice, and finally, thankful for the intermission, he led her to a table on the veranda. There was a moment's silence while she did unimpressive things with her fan. "'It's hotter here than in Eau Claire,' she said. Warren stifled a sigh and nodded. It might be, for all he knew, or cared. He wondered idly whether she was a poor conversationalist because she got no attention, or got no attention because she was a poor conversationalist. "'You going to be here much longer?' he asked, and then turned rather red. She might suspect his reasons for asking. "'Another week,' she answered, and stared at him as if to lunge at his next remark when it left his lips. Warren fidgeted. Then, with a sudden charitable impulse, he decided to try part of his line on her. He turned and looked at her eyes. "'You've got an awfully kissable mouth,' he began quietly. This was a remark that he sometimes made to girls at college proms 
when they were talking in just such half-dark as this. Bernice distinctly jumped. She turned an ungraceful red and became clumsy with her fan. No one had ever made such a remark to her before. Fresh! The word had slipped out before she realized it, and she bit her lip. Too late she decided to be amused, and offered him a flustered smile. Warren was annoyed, though not accustomed to have that remark taken seriously. Still, it usually provoked a laugh or a paragraph of sentimental banter. And he hated to be called fresh, except in a joking way. His charitable impulse died, and he switched the topic. Jim Strain and Ethel DeMarest, sitting out as usual, he commented. This was more in Bernice's line, but a faint regret mingled with her relief as the subject changed. Men did not talk to her about kissable mouths, but she knew that they talked in some such way to other girls. "'Oh, yes,' she said, and laughed. "'I hear they've been mooning round for years without a red penny. Isn't it silly?' Warren's disgust increased. Jim Strain was a close friend of his brother's, and anyway he considered it bad form to sneer at people for not having money. But Bernice had had no intention of sneering. She was merely nervous. CHAPTER Two. When Marjorie and Bernice reached home at half after midnight, they said good night at the top of the stairs. Though cousins, they were not intimates. As a matter of fact, Marjorie had no female intimates. She considered girls stupid. Bernice, on the contrary, all through this parent-arranged visit, had rather longed to exchange those confidences flavored with giggles and tears that she considered an indispensable factor in all feminine intercourse. But in this respect she found Marjorie rather cold, felt somehow the same difficulty in talking to her that she had in talking to men. Marjorie never giggled, was never frightened, seldom embarrassed, and, in fact, had very few of the qualities which Bernice considered appropriately and blessedly feminine. As Bernice busied herself with toothbrush and paste this night, she wondered, for the hundredth time, why she never had any attention when she was away from home. That her family were the wealthiest in Eau Claire, that her mother entertained tremendously, gave little dinners for her daughter before all dances, and bought her a car of her own to drive round in, never occurred to her as factors in her hometown social success. Like most girls, she had been brought up on the warm milk prepared by Annie Fellows Johnston, and on novels in which the female was beloved because of certain mysterious womanly qualities, always mentioned but never displayed. Bernice felt a vague pain that she was not at present engaged in being popular. She did not know that, had it not been for Marjorie's campaigning, she would have danced the entire evening with one man. But she knew that, even in Eau Claire, other girls with less position and less pulchritude were given a much bigger rush. She attributed this to something subtly unscrupulous in those girls. It had never worried her. And if it had, her mother would have assured her that the other girls cheapened themselves, and that men really respected girls like Bernice. She turned out the light in her bathroom, and on an impulse decided to go in and chat for a moment with her Aunt Josephine, whose light was still on. Her soft slippers bore her noiselessly down the carpeted hall, but hearing voices inside, she stopped near the partly open door. Then she caught her own name— and without any definite intention of eavesdropping, lingered, and the thread of the conversation going on inside pierced her consciousness sharply as if it had been drawn through with a needle. "'She's absolutely hopeless,' it was Marjorie's voice. "'Oh, I know what you're going to say. So many people have told you how pretty and sweet she is, and how she can cook. What of it? She has a bum time. Men don't like her.' "'What's a little cheap popularity?' Mrs. Harvey sounded annoyed. "'It's everything when you're eighteen, said Marjorie emphatically. "'I've done my best. I've been polite, and I've made men dance with her, but they just won't stand being bored. When I think of that gorgeous coloring wasted on such a ninny, and think what Martha Carey could do with it. Oh!' "'There's no courtesy these days.' Mrs. Harvey's voice implied that modern situations were too much for her. When she was a girl, all young ladies who belonged to nice families had glorious times. "'Well,' said Marjorie, "'no girl can permanently bolster up a lame-duck visitor, because these days it's every girl for herself. I've even tried to drop her hints about clothes and things, and she's been furious, given me the funniest looks. 
She's sensitive enough to know she's not getting away with much, but I'll bet she consoles herself by thinking that she's very virtuous, and that I'm too gay and fickle and will come to a bad end. All unpopular girls think that way. Sour grapes. Sarah Hopkins refers to Genevieve and Roberta and me as gardenia girls. I'll bet she'd give ten years of her life and her European education to be a gardenia girl and have three or four men in love with her and be cut in on every few feet at dances. It seems to me, interrupted Mrs. Harvey, rather wearily, that you ought to be able to do something for Bernice. I know she's not very vivacious. Marjorie groaned. Vivacious? Good grief! I've never heard her say anything to a boy except that it's hot or the floor's crowded or that she's going to school in New York next year. Sometimes she asks them what kind of car they have and tells them the kind she has. Thrilling! There was a short silence, and then Mrs. Harvey took up her refrain. All I know is that other girls not half so sweet and attractive get partners. Martha Carey, for instance, is stout and loud, and her mother is distinctly common. Roberta Dillon is so thin this year that she looks as though Arizona were the place for her. She's dancing herself to death. But, mother, objected Marjorie impatiently, Martha is cheerful and awfully witty and an awfully slick girl, and Roberta's a marvelous dancer. She's been popular for ages. Mrs. Harvey yawned. I think it's that crazy Indian blood in Bernice, continued Marjorie. Maybe she's a reversion to type. Indian women all just sat round and never said anything. Go to bed, you silly child, laughed Mrs. Harvey. I wouldn't have told you that if I thought you were going to remember it. And I think most of your ideas are perfectly idiotic, she finished sleepily. There was another silence while Marjorie considered whether or not convincing her mother was worth the trouble. People over forty can seldom be permanently convinced of anything. At eighteen, our convictions are hills from which we look. At forty-five, they are caves in which we hide. Having decided this, Marjorie said good night. When she came out into the hall, it was quite empty. Chapter 3 While Marjorie was breakfasting late next day, Bernice came into the room with a rather formal good morning, sat down opposite, stared intently over, and slightly moistened her lips. "'What's on your mind?' inquired Marjorie, rather puzzled. Bernice paused before she threw her hand grenade. "'I heard what you said about me to your mother last night.' Marjorie was startled, but she showed only a faintly heightened color, and her voice was quite even when she spoke. "'Where were you?' "'In the hall. I didn't mean to listen, at first. After an involuntary look of contempt, Marjorie dropped her eyes and became very interested in balancing a stray cornflake on her finger. "'I guess I'd better go back to Eau Claire if I'm such a nuisance.' Bernice's lower lip was trembling violently, and she continued on a wavering note. "'I've tried to be nice, and, and I've been first neglected and then insulted. No one ever visited me and got such treatment.' Marjorie was silent. "'But I'm in the way, I see. I'm a drag on you. Your friends don't like me.' She paused, and then remembered another one of her grievances. "'Of course I was furious last week when you tried to hint to me that that dress was unbecoming. Don't you think I know how to dress myself?' "'No,' murmured Marjorie, less than half aloud. "'What?' "'I didn't hint anything,' said Marjorie succinctly. I said, as I remember, that it was better to wear a becoming dress three times straight than to alternate it with two frights. Do you think that was a very nice thing to say? I wasn't trying to be nice. Then, after a pause, when do you want to go? Bernice drew in her breath sharply. Oh! It was a little half-cry. Marjorie looked up in surprise. Didn't you say you were going? "'Yes, but—oh, you were only bluffing.' They stared at each other across the breakfast-table for a moment. Misty waves were passing before Bernice's eyes, while Marjorie's face wore that rather hard expression that she used when slightly intoxicated undergraduates were making love to her. "'So you were bluffing,' she repeated, as if it were what she might have expected. Bernice admitted it by bursting into tears. Marjorie's eyes showed boredom. "'You're my cousin,' sobbed Bernice. 
I'm visiting you. I was to stay a month, and if I go home, my mother will know, and she'll wonder. Marjorie waited until the shower of broken words collapsed into little sniffles. I'll give you my month's allowance, she said coldly, and you can spend this last week anywhere you want. There's a very nice hotel. Bernice's sobs rose to a flute note, and rising of a sudden she fled from the room. An hour later, while Marjorie was in the library, absorbed in composing one of those non-committal, marvelously elusive letters that only a young girl can write, Bernice reappeared, very red-eyed and consciously calm. She cast no glance at Marjorie, but took a book at random from the shelf and sat down as if to read. Marjorie seemed absorbed in her letter and continued writing. When the clock showed noon, Bernice closed her book with a snap. "'I suppose I'd better get my railroad ticket.' This was not the beginning of the speech she had rehearsed upstairs, but as Marjorie was not getting her cues, wasn't urging her to be reasonable, it's all a mistake. It was the best opening she could muster. "'Just wait till I finish this letter,' said Marjorie, without looking round. "'I want to get it off in the next mail.' After another minute, during which her pen scratched busily, she turned round and relaxed with an air of, "'At your service.' Again Bernice had to speak. "'Do you want me to go home?' "'Well,' said Marjorie, considering, "'I suppose if you're not having a good time you'd better go. No use being miserable.' "'Don't you think common kindness?' "'Oh, please don't quote little women,' cried Marjorie impatiently. "'That's out of style.' "'You think so?' "'Heavens, yes! What modern girl could live like those inane females?' "'They were the models for our mothers.' Marjorie laughed. "'Yes, they were. Not. Besides, our mothers were all very well in their way, but they know very little about their daughters' problems.' Bernice drew herself up. "'Please don't talk about my mother.' Marjorie laughed. "'I don't think I mentioned her.' Bernice felt that she was being led away from her subject. "'Do you think you've treated me very well?' "'I've done my best. You're rather hard material to work with.' The lids of Bernice's eyes reddened. "'I think you're hard and selfish, and you haven't a feminine quality in you.' "'Oh, my Lord!' cried Marjorie in desperation. "'You little nut!' Girls like you are responsible for all the tiresome, colorless marriages, all those ghastly inefficiencies that pass as feminine qualities. What a blow it must be when a man with imagination marries the beautiful bundle of clothes that he's been building ideals round, and finds that she's just a weak, whining, cowardly mass of affectations. Bernice's mouth had slipped half open. The womanly woman, continued Marjorie, her whole early life is occupied in whining criticisms of girls like me who really do have a good time. Bernice's jaw descended farther as Marjorie's voice rose. There's some excuse for an ugly girl whining. If I'd been irretrievably ugly, I'd never have forgiven my parents for bringing me into the world. But you're starting life without any handicap. Marjorie's little fist clenched. If you expect me to weep with you, you'll be disappointed. Go or stay, just as you like and picking up her letters, she left the room. Bernice claimed a headache and failed to appear at luncheon. They had a matinee date for the afternoon, but the headache persisting, Marjorie made explanation to a not very downcast boy. But when she returned late in the afternoon, she found Bernice, with a strangely set face, waiting for her in her bedroom. "'I've decided,' began Bernice, without preliminaries, "'that maybe you're right about things. Possibly not. But if you'll tell me why your friends aren't aren't interested in me. I'll see if I can do what you want me to. Marjorie was at the mirror, shaking down her hair. Do you mean it? Yes. Without reservations? Will you do exactly what I say? Well, I... Well, nothing. Will you do exactly as I say? If they're sensible things. They're not. You're no case for sensible things. Are you going to make... to recommend... Yes, everything. If I tell you to take boxing lessons, you'll have to do it. Write home and tell your mother you're going to stay another two weeks. If you'll tell me... All right, I'll just give you a few examples now. First, you have no ease of manner. Why? 
because you're never sure about your personal appearance. When a girl feels that she's perfectly groomed and dressed, she can forget that part of her. That's charm. The more parts of yourself you can afford to forget, the more charm you have. Don't I look all right? No. For instance, you never take care of your eyebrows. They're black and lustrous, but by leaving them straggly, they're a blemish. They'd be beautiful if you'd take care of them in one-tenth the time you take doing nothing. You're going to brush them so that they'll grow straight. Bernice raised the brows in question. Do you mean to say that men notice eyebrows? Yes, subconsciously. And when you go home, you ought to have your teeth straightened a little. It's almost imperceptible. Still... But I thought, interrupted Bernice in bewilderment, that you despised little dainty feminine things like that. I hate dainty minds, answered Marjorie. But a girl has to be dainty in person. If she looks like a million dollars, she can talk about Russia, ping-pong, or the League of Nations, and get away with it. What else? Oh, I'm just beginning. There's your dancing. Don't I dance all right? No, you don't. You lean on a man. Yes, you do, ever so slightly. I noticed it when we were dancing together yesterday. And you dance standing up straight, instead of bending over a little. Probably some old lady on the sideline once told you that you looked so dignified that way. But except with a very small girl, it's much harder on the man, and he's the one that counts. Go on. Bernice's brain was reeling. Well, you've got to learn to be nice to men who are sad birds. You look as if you'd been insulted whenever you're thrown with any except the most popular boys. Why, Bernice, I'm cut in on every few feet, and who does most of it? Why, those very sad birds. No girl can afford to neglect them. They're the big part of any crowd. Young boys too shy to talk are the very best conversational practice. Clumsy boys are the best dancing practice. If you can follow them, and yet look graceful, you can follow a baby tank across a barbed wire skyscraper. Bernice sighed profoundly, but Marjorie was not through. If you go to a dance and really amuse, say, three sad birds that dance with you, if you talk so well to them that they forget they're stuck with you, you've done something. They'll come back next time, and gradually so many sad birds will dance with you that the attractive boys will see there's no danger of being stuck. Then they'll dance with you. Yes, agreed Bernice faintly. I think I begin to see. And finally, concluded Marjorie, poise and charm will just come. You'll wake up some morning knowing you've attained it, and men will know it, too. Bernice rose. It's been awfully kind of you, but nobody's ever talked to me like this before, and I feel sort of startled. Marjorie made no answer, but gazed pensively at her own image in the mirror. "'You're a peach to help me,' continued Bernice. Still Marjorie did not answer, and Bernice thought she had seemed too grateful. "'I know you don't like sentiment,' she said timidly. Marjorie turned to her quickly. "'Oh, I wasn't thinking about that. I was considering whether we hadn't better bob your hair.' Bernice collapsed backward upon the bed. End of Part 1 Bernice Bobs Her Hair, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. Bernice Bobs Her Hair by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Chapter 4. On the following Wednesday evening, there was a dinner dance at the country club. When the guests strolled in, Bernice found her place card with a slight feeling of irritation. Though at her right sat G. Reese Stoddard, a most desirable and distinguished young bachelor, the all-important left held only Charlie Paulson. Charlie lacked height, beauty, and social shrewdness, and in her new enlightenment, Bernice decided that his only qualification to be her partner was that he had never been stuck with her. But this feeling of irritation left with the last of the soup plates, and Marjorie's specific instruction came to her. Swallowing her pride, she turned to Charlie Paulson and plunged. "'Do you think I ought to bob my hair, Mr. Charlie Paulson?' Charlie looked up in surprise. "'Why?' "'Because I'm considering it. 
It's such a sure and easy way of attracting attention. Charlie smiled pleasantly. He could not know this had been rehearsed. He replied that he didn't know much about bobbed hair. But Bernice was there to tell him. I want to be a society vampire, you see, she announced coolly, and went on to inform him that bobbed hair was the necessary prelude. She added that she wanted to ask his advice because she had heard he was so critical about girls. Charlie, who knew as much about the psychology of women as he did of the mental states of Buddhist contemplatives, felt vaguely flattered. So I've decided, she continued, her voice rising slightly, that early next week I'm going down to the Sevier Hotel barber shop, sit in the first chair, and get my hair bobbed. She faltered, noticing that the people near her had paused in their conversation and were listening. But after a confused second, Marjorie's coaching told, and she finished her paragraph to the vicinity at large. Of course, I'm charging admission, but if you'll all come down and encourage me, I'll issue passes for the inside seats. There was a ripple of appreciative laughter, and under cover of it, G. Reese Stoddard leaned over quickly and said close to her ear, I'll take a box right now. She met his eyes and smiled, as if he had said something surpassingly brilliant. "'Do you believe in bobbed hair?' asked G. Reese, in the same undertone. "'I think it's unmoral,' affirmed Bernice gravely. "'But, of course, you've either got to amuse people, or feed them, or shock em. Marjorie had called this from Oscar Wilde. It was greeted with a ripple of laughter from the men, and a series of quick, intent looks from the girls. And then, as though she had said nothing of wit or moment, Bernice turned again to Charlie and spoke confidentially in his ear. "'I want to ask you your opinion of several people. I imagine you're a wonderful judge of character.' Charlie thrilled faintly, paid her a subtle compliment by overturning her water. Two hours later, while Warren McIntyre was standing passively in the stag line, abstractedly watching the dancers, and wondering whither and with whom Marjorie had disappeared, an unrelated perception began to creep slowly upon him, a perception that Bernice, cousin to Marjorie, had been cut in on several times in the past five minutes. He closed his eyes, opened them, and looked again. Several minutes back, she had been dancing with a visiting boy, a matter easily accounted for. A visiting boy would know no better. But now she was dancing with someone else, and there was Charlie Paulson headed for her with enthusiastic determination in his eye. Funny, Charlie seldom danced with more than three girls an evening. Warren was distinctly surprised when, the exchange having been effected, the man relieved proved to be none other than G. Reese Stoddard himself. And G. Reese seemed not at all jubilant at being relieved. Next time Bernice danced near, Warren regarded her intently. Yes, she was pretty, distinctly pretty, and tonight her face seemed really vivacious. She had that look that no woman, however histrionically proficient, can successfully counterfeit. She looked as if she were having a good time. He liked the way she had her hair arranged, wondered if it was brilliantine that made it glisten so. And that dress was becoming, a dark red that set off her shadowy eyes and high coloring. He remembered that he had thought her pretty when she first came to town, before he had realized that she was dull. Too bad she was dull. Dull girls unbearable. Certainly pretty, though. His thoughts zigzagged back to Marjorie. This disappearance would be like other disappearances. When she reappeared, he would demand where she had been, would be told emphatically that it was none of his business. What a pity she was so sure of him. She basked in the knowledge that no other girl in town interested him. She defied him to fall in love with Genevieve or Roberta. Warren sighed. The way to Marjorie's affections was a labyrinth indeed. He looked up. Bernice was again dancing with the visiting boy. Half unconsciously, he took a step out from the stag line in her direction, and hesitated. Then he said to himself that it was charity. He walked toward her, collided suddenly with G. Reese Stoddard. "'Pardon me,' said Warren. But G. Reese had not stopped to apologize. He had again cut in on Bernice." That night at one o'clock, Marjorie, with one hand on the electric light switch in the hall, turned to take a last look at Bernice's sparkling eyes. So it worked? Oh, Marjorie, yes, 
cried Bernice. I saw you were having a gay time. I did. The only trouble was that about midnight I ran short of talk. I had to repeat myself. With different men, of course. I hope they won't compare notes. Men don't, said Marjorie, yawning. And it wouldn't matter if they did. They'd think you were even trickier. She snapped out the light, and as they started up the stairs, Bernice grasped the banister, thankfully. For the first time in her life, she had been danced tired. "'You see,' said Marjorie at the top of the stairs, "'one man sees another man cut in, and he thinks there must be something there. "'Well, we'll fix up some new stuff tomorrow. Good night.' "'Good night.' As Bernice took down her hair, she passed the evening before her in review. She had followed instructions exactly. Even when Charlie Paulson cut in for the eighth time, she had simulated delight and had apparently been both interested and flattered. She had not talked about the weather or Eau Claire or automobiles or her school, but had confined her conversation to me, you, and us. But a few minutes before she fell asleep, a rebellious thought was churning drowsily in her brain. After all, it was she who had done it. Marjorie, to be sure, had given her her conversation. But then Marjorie got much of her conversation out of things she read. Bernice had bought the red dress, though she had never valued it highly before Marjorie dug it out of her trunk. And her own voice had said the words, her own lips had smiled, her own feet had danced. Marjorie, nice girl. Vain, though. Nice evening, nice boys, like Warren. Warren, Warren... What's his name? Warren. She fell asleep. Chapter 5 To Bernice, the next week was a revelation. With the feeling that people really enjoyed looking at her and listening to her came the foundation of self-confidence. Of course, there were numerous mistakes at first. She did not know, for instance, that Draycott Deo was studying for the ministry. She was unaware that he had cut in on her because he thought she was a quiet, reserved girl. Had she known these things, she would not have treated him to the line which began, Hello, Shell Shock, and continued with the bathtub story. It takes a frightful lot of energy to fix my hair in the summer. There's so much of it. So I always fix it first, and powder my face, and put on my hat. Then I get into the bathtub, and dress afterward. Don't you think that's the best plan? Though Draycott Deo was in the throes of difficulties concerning baptism by immersion, and might possibly have seen a connection, it must be admitted that he did not. He considered feminine bathing an immoral subject, and gave her some of his ideas on the depravity of modern society. But to offset that unfortunate occurrence, Bernice had several signal successes to her credit. Little Otis Ormond pleaded off from a trip east, and elected instead to follow her with a puppy-like devotion, to the amusement of his crowd, and to the irritation of G. Reese Stoddard, several of whose afternoon calls Otis completely ruined by the disgusting tenderness of the glances he bent on Bernice. He even told her the story of the two-by-four and the dressing-room, to show her how frightfully mistaken he and everyone else had been in their first judgment of her. Bernice laughed off that incident with a slight sinking sensation. Of all Bernice's conversation, perhaps the best known and most universally approved was the line about the bobbing of her hair. "'Oh, Bernice, when you going to get the hair bobbed?' "'Day after tomorrow, maybe,' she would reply, laughing. "'Will you come and see me? Because I'm counting on you, you know.' "'Will we? You know. But you better hurry up.' Bernice, whose tonsorial intentions were strictly dishonorable, would laugh again. Pretty soon now, you'd be surprised. But perhaps the most significant symbol of her success was the gray car of the hypercritical Warren McIntyre, parked daily in front of the Harvey house. At first, the parlor-maid was distinctly startled when he asked for Bernice instead of Marjorie. After a week of it, she told the cook that Miss Bernice had got a hold of Miss Marjorie's best fella and Miss Bernice had. Perhaps it began with Warren's desire to rouse jealousy in Marjorie. Perhaps it was the familiar, though unrecognized, strain of Marjorie in Bernice's conversation. Perhaps it was both of these, and something of sincere attraction besides. 
but somehow the collective mind of the younger set knew within a week that Marjorie's most reliable beau had made an amazing face-about, and was giving an indisputable rush to Marjorie's guest. The question of the moment was how Marjorie would take it. Warren called Bernice on the phone twice a day, sent her notes, and they were frequently seen together in his roadster, obviously engrossed in one of those tense, significant conversations as to whether or not he was sincere. Marjorie, on being twitted, only laughed. She said she was mighty glad that Warren had at last found someone who appreciated him. So the younger set laughed, too, and guessed that Marjorie didn't care, and let it go at that. One afternoon, when there were only three days left of her visit, Bernice was waiting in the hall for Warren, with whom she was going to a bridge party. She was in rather a blissful mood, and when Marjorie, also bound for the party, appeared beside her and began casually to adjust her hat in the mirror, Bernice was utterly unprepared for anything in the nature of a clash. Marjorie did her work very coldly and succinctly in three sentences. "'You may as well get Warren out of your head,' she said coldly. What? Bernice was utterly astounded. You may as well stop making a fool of yourself over Warren McIntyre. He doesn't care a snap of his fingers about you. For a tense moment they regarded each other, Marjorie scornful, aloof, Bernice astounded, half angry, half afraid. Then two cars drove up in front of the house, and there was a riotous honking. Both of them gasped faintly, turned, and side by side hurried out. All through the bridge party, Bernice strove in vain to master a rising uneasiness. She had offended Marjorie, the Sphinx of Sphinxes. With the most wholesome and innocent intentions in the world, she had stolen Marjorie's property. She felt suddenly and horribly guilty. After the bridge game, when they sat in an informal circle and the conversation became general, the storm gradually broke. Little Otis Ormond inadvertently precipitated it. "'When you going back to kindergarten, Otis?' someone had asked. "'Me?' Dave Bernice gets her hair bobbed. "'Then your education's over,' said Marjorie quickly. "'That's only a bluff of hers. I should think you'd have realized.' "'That a fact,' demanded Otis, giving Bernice a reproachful glance. Bernice's ears burned as she tried to think up an effectual comeback. In the face of this direct attack, her imagination was paralyzed.' "'There's a lot of bluffs in the world,' continued Marjorie, quite pleasantly. "'I should think you'd be young enough to know that, Otis.' "'Well,' said Otis, "'maybe so. "'But, gee, with a line like Bernice's—' "'Really?' yawned Marjorie. "'What's her latest bon mot?' "'No one seemed to know. "'In fact, Bernice, having trifled with her muse's bow, "'had said nothing memorable of late.' "'Was that really all a line?' asked Roberta curiously. Bernice hesitated. She felt that wit in some form was demanded of her, but under her cousin's suddenly frigid eyes she was completely incapacitated. "'I don't know,' she stalled. "'Splush,' said Marjorie. "'Admit it.' Bernice saw that Warren's eyes had left a ukulele he had been tinkering with, and were fixed on her questioningly. "'Oh, I don't know,' she repeated steadily. Her cheeks were glowing. "'Splush,' remarked Marjorie again. "'Come through, Bernice,' urged Otis. "'Tell her where to get off.' Bernice looked round again. She seemed unable to get away from Warren's eyes. "'I like bobbed hair,' she said hurriedly, as if he had asked her a question. "'And I intend to bob mine.' "'When?' demanded Marjorie. Any time. No time like the present, suggested Roberta. Otis jumped to his feet. Good stuff, he cried. We'll have a summer bobbing party. Sevier Hotel Barbershop, I think you said. In an instant, all were on their feet. Bernice's heart throbbed violently. What? she gasped. Out of the group came Marjorie's voice, very clear and contemptuous. Don't worry, she'll back out. Come on, Bernice, cried Otis, starting toward the door. Four eyes, Warren's and Marjorie's, stared at her, challenged her, defied her. For another second she wavered wildly. 
I'll write, she said swiftly. I don't care if I do. An eternity of minutes later, riding downtown through the late afternoon beside Warren, the others following in Roberta's car close behind, Bernice had all the sensations of Marie Antoinette bound for the guillotine in a tumbrel. Vaguely she wondered why she did not cry out that it was all a mistake. It was all she could do to keep from clutching her hair with both hands to protect it from the suddenly hostile world. Yet she did neither. Even the thought of her mother was no deterrent now. This was the test supreme of her sportsmanship, her right to walk unchallenged in the starry heaven of popular girls. Warren was moodily silent, and when they came to the hotel, he drew up at the curb and nodded to Bernice to precede him out. Roberta's car emptied a laughing crowd into the shop, which presented two bold plate-glass windows to the street. Bernice stood on the curb and looked at the sign, Sevier Barber Shop. It was a guillotine indeed, and the hangman was the first barber, who, attired in a white coat and smoking a cigarette, leaned nonchalantly against the first chair. He must have heard of her. He must have been waiting all week, smoking eternal cigarettes beside that portentous, too often mentioned, first chair. Would they blindfold her? No, but they would tie a white cloth round her neck, lest any of her blood, nonsense, hair, should get on her clothes. All right, Bernice, said Warren quickly. With her chin in the air, she crossed the sidewalk, pushed open the swinging screen door, and giving not a glance to the uproarious, riotous row that occupied the waiting bench, went up to the first barber. I want you to bob my hair. The first barber's mouth slid somewhat open. His cigarette dropped to the floor. Huh? My hair. Bob it. Refusing further preliminaries, Bernice took her seat on high. A man in the chair next to her turned on his side and gave her a glance, half lather, half amazement. One barber started and spoiled little Willie Schoonman's monthly haircut. Mr. O'Reilly in the last chair grunted and swore musically in ancient Gaelic as a razor bit into his cheek. Two bootblacks became wide-eyed and rushed for her feet. No, Bernice didn't care for a shine. Outside, a passerby stopped and stared. A couple joined him. Half a dozen small boys' noses sprang into life, flattened against the glass, and snatches of conversation borne on the summer breeze drifted in through the screen door. Look at the long hair on a kid. Where'd you get at stuff? That's a bearded lady he just finished shaving. But Bernice saw nothing, heard nothing. Her only living sense told her that this man in the white coat had removed one tortoiseshell comb and then another that his fingers were fumbling clumsily with unfamiliar hairpins, that this hair, this wonderful hair of hers, was going. She would never again feel its long, voluptuous pull as it hung in a dark brown glory down her back. For a second she was near breaking down, and then the picture before her swam mechanically into her vision, Marjorie's mouth curling in a faint, ironic smile as if to say, "'Give up and get down.' You tried to buck me, and I called your bluff. You see, you haven't got a prayer. And some last energy rose up in Bernice, for she clenched her hands under the white cloth, and there was a curious narrowing of her eyes that Marjorie remarked on to someone long afterward. Twenty minutes later, the barber swung her round to face the mirror, and she flinched at the full extent of the damage that had been wrought. Her hair was not curly and now it lay in lank, lifeless blocks on both sides of her suddenly pale face. It was ugly as sin. She had known it would be ugly as sin. Her face's chief charm had been a Madonna-like simplicity. Now that was gone, and she was, well, frightfully mediocre. Not stagey, only ridiculous, like a Greenwich villager who had left her spectacles at home. As she climbed down from the chair, she tried to smile failed miserably. She saw two of the girls exchange glances, noticed Marjorie's mouth curved in attenuated mockery, and that Warren's eyes were suddenly very cold. You see, her words fell into an awkward pause. I've done it. Yes, you've done it, admitted Warren. Do you like it? There was a half-hearted, sure, from two or three voices, 
another awkward pause, and then Marjorie turned swiftly and with serpent-like intensity to Warren. "'Would you mind running me down to the cleaners?' she asked. "'I've simply got to get a dress there before supper. Roberta's driving right home, and she can take the others.' Warren stared abstractedly at some infinite speck out the window. Then for an instant his eyes rested coldly on Bernice, before they turned to Marjorie. "'Be glad to,' he said slowly. Chapter 6 Bernice did not fully realize the outrageous trap that had been set for her until she met her aunt's amazed glance just before dinner. "'Why, Bernice!' "'I've bobbed it, Aunt Josephine.' "'Why, child!' "'Do you like it?' "'Why, Bernice!' "'I suppose I've shocked you.' "'No, but what'll Mrs. Deo think tomorrow night? "'Bernice, you should have waited until after the Deo's dance. "'You should have waited if you wanted to do that.' "'It was sudden, Aunt Josephine. "'Anyway, why does it matter to Mrs. Deo particularly?' "'Why, child!' cried Mrs. Harvey. In her paper on the foibles of the younger generation that she read at the last meeting of the Thursday Club, she devoted fifteen minutes to bobbed hair. It's her pet abomination. And the dance is for you and Marjorie. I'm sorry. Oh, Bernice, what'll your mother say? She'll think I'll let you do it. I'm sorry. Dinner was an agony. She had made a hasty attempt with a curling iron and burned her finger and much hair. She could see that her aunt was both worried and grieved, and her uncle kept saying, "'Well, I'll be darned,' over and over, in a hurt and faintly hostile tone. And Marjorie sat very quietly, entrenched behind a faint smile, a faintly mocking smile. Somehow she got through the evening. Three boys called. Marjorie disappeared with one of them, and Bernice made a listless, unsuccessful attempt to entertain the two others sighed thankfully as she climbed the stairs to her room at half-past ten. What a day! When she had undressed for the night, the door opened, and Marjorie came in. Bernice, she said, I'm awfully sorry about the Deo dance. I'll give you my word of honor. I'd forgotten all about it. It's all right, said Bernice shortly. Standing before the mirror, she passed her comb slowly through her short hair. I'll take you downtown tomorrow continued Marjorie, and the hairdresser will fix it so you'll look slick. I didn't imagine you'd go through with it. I'm really mighty sorry. Oh, it's all right. Still, it's your last night, so I suppose it won't matter much. Then Bernice winced as Marjorie tossed her own hair over her shoulders and began to twist it slowly into two long, blonde braids, until, in her cream-colored negligee, she looked like the delicate painting of some Saxon princess. Fascinated, Bernice watched the braids grow. Heavy and luxurious they were, moving under the supple fingers like restive snakes, and to Bernice remained this relic and the curling iron and a tomorrow full of eyes. She could see G. Reese Stoddard, who liked her, assuming his Harvard manner and telling his dinner partner that Bernice shouldn't have been allowed to go to the movies so much. She could see Draycott Deo exchanging glances with his mother and then being conscientiously charitable to her. But then, perhaps by tomorrow, Mrs. Deo would have heard the news, would send round an icy little note requesting that she fail to appear, and behind her back they would all laugh and know that Marjorie had made a fool of her, that her chance at beauty had been sacrificed to the jealous whim of a selfish girl. She sat down suddenly before the mirror, biting the inside of her cheek. "'I like it,' she said with an effort. "'I think it'll be becoming.' Marjorie smiled. It looks all right. For heaven's sake, don't let it worry you. I won't. Good night, Bernice. But as the door closed, something snapped within Bernice. She sprang dynamically to her feet, clenching her hands, then swiftly and noiselessly crossed over to her bed, and from underneath it dragged out her suitcase. Into it she tossed toilet articles and a change of clothing. Then she turned to her trunk and quickly dumped in two drawerfuls of lingerie and summer dresses. She moved quietly, but with deadly efficiency, and in three-quarters of an hour her trunk was locked and strapped, and she was fully dressed in a becoming new traveling suit that Marjorie had helped her pick out. 
Sitting down at her desk, she wrote a short note to Mrs. Harvey, in which she briefly outlined her reasons for going. She sealed it, addressed it, and laid it on her pillow. She glanced at her watch. The train left at one, and she knew that if she walked down to the Marlborough Hotel two blocks away, she could easily get a taxicab. Suddenly she drew in her breath sharply, and an expression flashed into her eyes that a practiced character reader might have connected vaguely with the set look she had worn in the barber's chair, somehow a development of it. It was quite a new look for Bernice, and it carried consequences. She went stealthily to the bureau, picked up an article that lay there, and turning out all the lights stood quietly until her eyes became accustomed to the darkness. Softly, she pushed open the door to Marjorie's room. She heard the quiet, even breathing of an untroubled conscience asleep. She was by the bedside now, very deliberate and calm. She acted swiftly. Bending over, she found one of the braids of Marjorie's hair, followed it up with her hand to the point nearest the head, and then holding it a little slack so that the sleeper would feel no pull, she reached down with the shears and severed it. With the pigtail in her hand, she held her breath. Marjorie had muttered something in her sleep. Bernice deftly amputated the other braid, paused for an instant, and then flitted swiftly and silently back to her own room. Downstairs she opened the big front door, closed it carefully behind her, and, feeling oddly happy and exuberant, stepped off the porch into the moonlight, swinging her heavy grip like a shopping bag. After a minute's brisk walk, she discovered that her left hand still held the two blonde braids. She laughed unexpectedly, had to shut her mouth hard to keep from emitting an absolute peal. She was passing Warren's house now, and on the impulse she set down her baggage, and swinging the braids like pieces of rope, flung them at the wooden porch, where they landed with a slight thud. She laughed again, no longer restraining herself. Ha! Huh, she giggled wildly. Scalp the selfish thing. Then, picking up her suitcase, she set off at a half run down the moonlit street. End of Bernice Bobs Her Hair by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Benediction, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Benediction by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part One. Chapter One. The Baltimore station was hot and crowded, so Lois was forced to stand by the telegraph desk for interminable, sticky seconds while a clerk with big front teeth counted and recounted a large lady's day message to determine whether it contained the innocuous forty-nine words or the fatal fifty-one. Lois, waiting, decided she wasn't quite sure of the address, so she took the letter out of her bag and ran over it again. Darling, it began, I understand, and I'm happier than life ever meant me to be. If I could give you the things you've always been in tune with, but I can't, Lois. We can't marry, and we can't lose each other and let all this glorious love end in nothing. Until your letter came, dear, I'd been sitting here in the half-dark and thinking where I could go and ever forget you. Abroad, perhaps, to drift through Italy or Spain, and dream away the pain of having lost you, where the crumbling ruins of older, mellower civilizations would mirror only the desolation of my heart. And then your letter came. Sweetest, bravest girl, if you'll wire me, I'll meet you in Wilmington. Till then I'll be here just waiting and hoping for every long dream of you to come true. Howard She had read the letter so many times that she knew it word by word, yet it still startled her. In it she found many faint reflections of the man who wrote it, the mingled sweetness and sadness in his dark eyes, the furtive, restless excitement she felt sometimes when he talked to her, his dreamy sensuousness that lulled her mind to sleep. Lois was nineteen, and very romantic, and curious, and courageous. The large lady and the clerk, having compromised on fifty words, Lois took a blank and wrote her telegram. And there were no overtones to the finality of her decision. It's just destiny, she thought. It's just the way things work out in this damn world. 
If cowardice is all that's been holding me back, there won't be any more holding back. So we'll just let things take their course and never be sorry. The clerk scanned her telegram. Arrived Baltimore today. Spend day with my brother. Meet me Wilmington, 3 p.m. Wednesday. Love, Lois. Fifty-four cents, said the clerk admiringly. And never be sorry, thought Lois. And never be sorry. Chapter 2 Trees filtering light onto dappled grass. Trees like tall, languid ladies with feather fans coquetting airily with the ugly roof of the monastery. Trees like butlers, bending courteously over placid walks and paths. Trees, trees over the hills on either side, and scattering out in clumps and lines and woods, all through eastern Maryland. Delicate lace on the hems of many yellow fields. Dark, opaque backgrounds for flowered bushes or wild climbing gardens. Some of the trees were very gay and young, but the monastery trees were older than the monastery, which, by true monastic standards, wasn't very old at all. And, as a matter of fact, it wasn't technically called a monastery, but only a seminary. Nevertheless, it shall be a monastery here, despite its Victorian architecture, or its Edward the Seventh additions, or even its Woodrow Wilsonian patented last a century roofing. Out behind was the farm where half a dozen lay brothers were sweating lustily as they moved with deadly efficiency around the vegetable gardens. To the left, behind a row of elms, was an informal baseball diamond where three novices were being batted out by a fourth, amid great chasings and puffings and blowings. And in front, as a great mellow bell boomed the half-hour, a swarm of black human leaves were blown over the checkerboard of paths under the courteous trees. Some of these black leaves were very old, with cheeks furrowed like the first ripples of a splashed pool. Then there was a scattering of middle-aged leaves, whose forms, when viewed in profile in their revealing gowns, were beginning to be faintly unsymmetrical. These carried thick volumes of Thomas Aquinas and Henry James and Cardinal Mercier and Immanuel Kant, and many bulging notebooks filled with lecture data. But most numerous were the young leaves, blond boys of nineteen with very stern, conscientious expressions, men in the late twenties with a keen self-assurance from having taught out in the world for five years, several hundreds of them, from city and town and country, in Maryland and Pennsylvania and Virginia and West Virginia and Delaware. There were many Americans and some Irish and some tough Irish and a few French and several Italians and Poles, and they walked informally arm in arm with each other in twos and threes or in long rows, almost universally distinguished by the straight mouth and the considerable chin. For this was the Society of Jesus, founded in Spain five hundred years before by a tough-minded soldier who trained men to hold a breach or a salon, preach a sermon or write a treaty, and do it and not argue. Lois got out of a bus into the sunshine down by the outer gate. She was nineteen, with yellow hair and eyes that people were tactful enough not to call green. When men of talent saw her in a street car, they often furtively produced little stub pencils and backs of envelopes, and tried to sum up that profile or the thing that the eyebrows did to her eyes. Later they looked at their results, and usually tore them up with wondering sighs. Though Lois was very jauntily attired in an expensively appropriate traveling affair, she did not linger to pat out the dust which covered her clothes, but started up the central walk with curious glances at either side. Her face was very eager and expectant, yet she hadn't at all that glorified expression that girls wear when they arrive for a senior prom at Princeton or New Haven. Still, as there were no senior proms here, perhaps it didn't matter. She was wondering what he would look like, whether she'd possibly know him from his picture. In the picture, which hung over her mother's bureau at home, he seemed very young and hollow-cheeked and rather pitiful, with only a well-developed mouth and an ill-fitting probationer's gown to show that he had already made a momentous decision about his life. Of course, he had been only nineteen then, and now he was thirty-six. Didn't look like that at all. In recent snapshots, he was much broader, and his hair had grown a little thin. 
but the impression of her brother she had always retained was that of the big picture. And so she had always been a little sorry for him. What a life for a man! Seventeen years of preparation, and he wasn't even a priest yet. Wouldn't be for another year. Lois had an idea that this was all going to be rather solemn, if she let it be. But she was going to give her very best imitation of undiluted sunshine, the imitation she could give, even when her head was splitting, or when her mother had a nervous breakdown, or when she was particularly romantic and curious and courageous. This brother of hers undoubtedly needed cheering up, and he was going to be cheered up, whether he liked it or not. As she drew near the great, homely front door, she saw a man break suddenly away from a group, and, pulling up the skirts of his gown, run toward her. He was smiling, she noticed, and he looked very big and, and reliable. She stopped and waited, knew that her heart was beating unusually fast. "'Lois!' he cried, and in a second she was in his arms. She was suddenly trembling. "'Lois!' he cried again. "'Why, this is wonderful! I can't tell you, Lois, how much I've looked forward to this. Why, Lois, you're beautiful!' Lois gasped. His voice, though restrained, was vibrant with energy, and that odd sort of enveloping personality she had thought that she only of the family possessed. "'I'm mighty glad, too, Keith.' She flushed, but not unhappily, at this first use of his name. "'Lois, Lois, Lois,' he repeated in wonder. "'Child, we'll go in here a minute, because I want you to meet the rector, and then we'll walk around.' I have a thousand things to talk to you about. His voice became graver. How's mother? She looked at him for a moment, and then said something that she had not intended to say at all, the very sort of thing she had resolved to avoid. Oh, Keith, she's, she's getting worse all the time, every way. He nodded slowly, as if he understood. Nervous. Well, you can tell me about that later. Now. She was in a small study with a large desk, saying something to a little, jovial, white-haired priest who retained her hand for some seconds. So, this is Lois. He said it as if he had heard of her for years. He entreated her to sit down. Two other priests arrived enthusiastically, and shook hands with her, and addressed her as Keith's little sister, which she found she didn't mind a bit. How assured they seemed. She had expected a certain shyness, reserve at least. There were several jokes unintelligible to her, which seemed to delight everyone, and the little father rector referred to the trio of them as dim old monks, which she appreciated, because, of course, they weren't monks at all. She had a lightning impression that they were especially fond of Keith. The father rector had called him Keith, and one of the others had kept a hand on his shoulder all through the conversation. Then she was shaking hands again and promising to come back a little later for some ice cream, and smiling and smiling and being rather absurdly happy. She told herself that it was because Keith was so delighted in showing her off. Then she and Keith were strolling along a path, arm in arm, and he was informing her what an absolute jewel the father rector was. Lois, he broke off suddenly. I want to tell you before we go any farther how much it means to me to have you come up here. I think it was mighty sweet of you. I know what a gay time you've been having. Lois gasped. She was not prepared for this. At first, when she had conceived the plan of taking the hot journey down to Baltimore, staying the night with a friend, and then coming out to see her brother, she had felt rather consciously virtuous hoped he wouldn't be priggish or resentful about her not having come before. But walking here with him under the trees seemed such a little thing, and surprisingly a happy thing. "'Why, Keith,' she said quickly, "'you know I couldn't have waited a day longer. I saw you when I was five, but of course I didn't remember. And how could I have gone on without practically ever having seen my only brother?' "'It was mighty sweet of you, Lois,' he repeated." Lois blushed. He did have personality. "'I want you to tell me all about yourself,' he said, after a pause. 
Of course I have a general idea what you and mother did in Europe those fourteen years. And then we were all so worried, Lois, when you had pneumonia and couldn't come down with mother. Let's see, that was two years ago. And then, well, I've seen your name in the papers, but it's all been so unsatisfactory. I haven't known you, Lois. She found herself analyzing his personality, as she analyzed the personality of every man she met. She wondered if the effect of, of intimacy that he gave was bred by his constant repetition of her name. He said it as if he loved the word, as if it had an inherent meaning to him. "'Then you were at school,' he continued. "'Yes, at Farmington. Mother wanted me to go to a convent, but I didn't want to.' She cast a side glance at him to see if he would resent this, but he only nodded slowly. "'Had enough convents abroad, eh?' "'Yes, and Keith, convents are different there anyway. Here, even in the nicest ones, there are so many common girls.' He nodded again. "'Yes,' he agreed. "'I suppose there are, and I know how you feel about it. "'It grated on me here at first, Lois, "'though I wouldn't say that to anyone but you. "'We're rather sensitive, you and I, to things like this.' "'You mean the men here?' "'Yes, some of them, of course, were fine, "'the sort of men I'd always been thrown with. "'But there were others. "'A man named Regan, for instance. "'I hated the fellow, and now he's about the best friend I have.' A wonderful character, Lois. You'll meet him later. Sort of man you'd like to have with you in a fight. Lois was thinking that Keith was the sort of man she'd like to have with her in a fight. How did you, how did you first happen to do it? She asked, rather shyly. To come here, I mean. Of course, Mother told me the story about the Pullman car. Oh, that. He looked rather annoyed. Tell me that. I'd like to hear you tell it. Oh, it's nothing, except what you probably know. It was evening, and I'd been writing all day and thinking about, about a hundred things, Lois. And then suddenly I had a sense that someone was sitting across from me, felt that he'd been there for some time, and had a vague idea that he was another traveler. All at once he leaned over toward me, and I heard a voice say, I want you to be a priest. That's what I want. Well, I jumped up and cried out, Oh, my God, not that! made an idiot of myself before about twenty people. You see, there wasn't anyone sitting there at all. A week after that, I went to the Jesuit College in Philadelphia and crawled up the last flight of stairs to the rector's office on my hands and knees. There was another silence, and Lois saw that her brother's eyes wore a far-away look, and that he was staring unseeingly out over the sunny fields. She was stirred by the modulations of his voice and the sudden silence that seemed to flow about him when he finished speaking. She noticed now that his eyes were of the same fiber as hers, with the green left out, and that his mouth was much gentler, really, than in the picture. Or was it that the face had grown up to it lately? He was getting a little bald just on top of his head. She wondered if that was from wearing a hat so much. It seemed awful for a man to grow bald, and no one to care about it. Were you pious when you were young, Keith? she asked. You know what I mean. Were you religious, if you don't mind these personal questions? Yes, he said, with his eyes still far away, and she felt that his intense abstraction was as much a part of his personality as his attention. Yes, I suppose I was when I was sober. Lois thrilled slightly. Did you drink? He nodded. I was on the way to making a bad hash of things. He smiled, and turning his gray eyes on her, changed the subject. Child, tell me about mother. I know it's been awfully hard for you there lately. I know you've had to sacrifice a lot, and put up with a great deal. And I want you to know how fine of you I think it is. I feel, Lois, that you're sort of taking the place of both of us there. Lois thought quickly how little she had sacrificed how lately she had constantly avoided her nervous, half-invalid mother. "'Youth shouldn't be sacrificed to age, Keith,' she said steadily. "'I know,' he sighed. "'And you oughtn't to have the weight on your shoulders, child. I wish I were there to help you.' 
she saw how quickly he had turned her remark, and instantly she knew what this quality was that he gave off. He was sweet. Her thoughts went off on a side track, and then she broke the silence with an odd remark. Sweetness is hard, she said suddenly. What? Nothing, she denied in confusion. I didn't mean to speak aloud. I was thinking of something, of a conversation with a man named Freddy Kebble. Maury Kebble's brother? Yes, she said, rather surprised to think of him having known Maury Kebble. Still, there was nothing strange about it. Well, he and I were talking about sweetness a few weeks ago. Oh, I don't know. I said that a man named Howard, that a man I knew, was sweet, and he didn't agree with me. And we began talking about what sweetness in a man was. He kept telling me I meant a sort of soppy softness, but I knew I didn't. Yet I didn't know exactly how to put it. I see now. I meant just the opposite. I suppose real sweetness is a sort of hardness and strength. Keith nodded. I see what you mean. I've known old priests who had it. I'm talking about young men, she said, rather defiantly. They had reached the now deserted baseball diamond, and pointing her to a wooden bench, he sprawled full length on the grass. Are these young men happy here, Keith? Don't they look happy, Lois? I suppose so, but those young ones, those two we just passed, have they, are they... Are they signed up? He laughed. No, but they will be next month. Permanently? Yes, unless they break down mentally or physically. Of course, in a discipline like ours, a lot drop out. But those boys, are they giving up fine chances outside, like you did? He nodded. Some of them. But, Keith, they don't know what they're doing. They haven't had any experience of what they're missing. No, I suppose not. It doesn't seem fair. Life has just sort of scared them at first. Do they all come in so young? No, some of them have knocked around, led pretty wild lives. Regan, for instance. I should think that sort would be better, she said meditatively. Men that had seen life. No, said Keith earnestly. I'm not sure that knocking about gives a man the sort of experience he can communicate to others. Some of the broadest men I've known have been absolutely rigid about themselves. And reformed libertines are a notoriously intolerant class. Don't you think so, Lois? She nodded, still meditative, and he continued. It seems to me that when one weak person goes to another, it isn't help they want. It's a sort of companionship in guilt, Lois. After you were born, when Mother began to get nervous, she used to go and weep with a certain Mrs. Comstock. Lord, it used to make me shiver. She said it comforted her. Poor old Mother. No, I don't think that to help others you've got to show yourself at all. Real help comes from a stronger person whom you respect, and their sympathy is all the bigger because it's impersonal. But people want human sympathy, objected Lois. They want to feel the other person's been tempted. Lois, in their hearts, they want to feel that the other person's been weak. That's what they mean by human. Here in this old monkery, Lois, he continued with a smile, they try to get all that self-pity and pride in our own wills out of us right at the first. They put us to scrubbing floors and other things. It's like that idea of saving your life by losing it. You see, we sort of feel that the less human a man is, in your sense of human, the better servant he can be to humanity. We carry it out to the end, too. When one of us dies, his family can't even have him then. He's buried here under a plain wooden cross with a thousand others. His tone changed suddenly, and he looked at her with a great brightness in his gray eyes. But way back in a man's heart there are some things he can't get rid of, and one of them is that I'm awfully in love with my little sister. With a sudden impulse, she knelt beside him in the grass, and, leaning over, kissed his forehead. You're hard, Keith, she said, and I love you for it. And you're sweet. End of Part One
Benediction Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Benediction by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part Two. Chapter Three. Back in the reception room, Lois met a half dozen more of Keith's particular friends. There was a young man named Jarvis, rather pale and delicate-looking, who, she knew, must be a grandson of old Mrs. Jarvis at home, and she mentally compared this ascetic with a brace of his riotous uncles. And there was Regan, with a scarred face and piercing, intent eyes that followed her about the room, and often rested on Keith with something very like worship. She knew then what Keith had meant about a good man to have with you in a fight. He's the missionary type, she thought vaguely. China or something. I want Keith's sister to show us what the shimmy is, demanded one young man with a broad grin. Lois laughed. I'm afraid the father rector would send me shimmying out the gate. Besides, I'm not an expert. I'm sure it wouldn't be best for Jimmy's soul anyway said Keith solemnly. He's inclined to brood about things like shimmies. They were just starting to do the Maxiques, wasn't it, Jimmy, when he became a monk, and it haunted him his whole first year. You'd see him when he was peeling potatoes, putting his arm around the bucket, and making irreligious motions with his feet. There was a general laugh in which Lois joined. An old lady who comes here to Mass sent Keith this ice cream, whispered Jarvis under cover of the laugh because she'd heard you were coming. It's pretty good, isn't it? There were tears trembling in Lois's eyes. Chapter 4 Then, half an hour later, over in the chapel, things suddenly went all wrong. It was several years since Lois had been at benediction, and at first she was thrilled by the gleaming monstrance with its central spot of white, the air rich and heavy with incense and the sun shining through the stained-glass window of St. Francis Xavier overhead, and falling in warm red tracery on the cassock of the man in front of her. But at the first notes of the O Salutaris Hostia, a heavy weight seemed to descend upon her soul. Keith was on her right, and young Jarvis on her left, and she stole uneasy glances at both of them. "'What's the matter with me?' she thought impatiently. She looked again. Was there a certain coldness in both their profiles that she had not noticed before? A pallor about the mouth, and a curious set expression in their eyes. She shivered slightly. They were like dead men. She felt her soul recede suddenly from Keith's. This was her brother, this, this unnatural person. She caught herself in the act of a little laugh. What is the matter with me? She passed her hand over her eyes, and the weight increased. The incense sickened her, and a stray, ragged note from one of the tenors in the choir grated on her ear like the shriek of a slate pencil. She fidgeted, and raising her hand to her hair, touched her forehead, found moisture on it. It's hot in here, hot as the deuce. Again she repressed a faint laugh and then in an instant the weight upon her heart suddenly diffused into cold fear. It was that candle on the altar. It was all wrong, wrong. Why didn't somebody see it? There was something in it. There was something coming out of it, taking form and shape above it. She tried to fight down her rising panic, told herself it was the wick. If the wick wasn't straight, candles did something. But they didn't do this. With incalculable rapidity, a force was gathering within her, a tremendous, assimilative force, drawing from every sense, every corner of her brain, and as it surged up inside her, she felt an enormous, terrified repulsion. She drew her arms in close to her side, away from Keith and Jarvis. Something in that candle. She was leaning forward. In another moment, she felt she would go forward toward it. Didn't anyone see it? Anyone? Ugh! She felt a space beside her, and something told her that Jarvis had gasped and sat down very suddenly. Then she was kneeling, and as the flaming monstrance slowly left the altar in the hands of the priest, she heard a great rushing noise in her ears. 
the crash of the bells was like hammer blows and then in a moment that seemed eternal a great torrent rolled over her heart there was a shouting there and a lashing as of waves she was calling felt herself calling for keith her lips mouthing the words that would not come keith oh my god keith suddenly she became aware of a new presence something external in front of her consummated and expressed in warm red tracery then she knew it was the window of St. Francis Xavier. Her mind gripped at it, clung to it finally, and she felt herself calling again endlessly, impotently, Keith! Keith! Then out of a great stillness came a voice. Blessed be God! With a gradual rumble sounded the response, rolling heavily through the chapel. Blessed be God! The words sang instantly in her heart. The incense lay mystically and sweetly peaceful upon the air, and the candle on the altar went out. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be his holy name. Everything blurred into a swinging mist. With a sound, half gasp, half cry, she rocked on her feet and reeled backward into Keith's suddenly outstretched arms. Chapter 5 Lie still, child. She closed her eyes again. She was on the grass outside, pillowed on Keith's arm, and Regan was dabbing her head with a cold towel. I'm all right, she said quietly. I know, but just lie still a minute longer. It was too hot in there. Jarvis felt it, too. She laughed as Regan again touched her gingerly with the towel. I'm all right, she repeated. But though a warm peace was filling her mind and heart, she felt oddly broken and chastened, as if someone had held her stripped soul up and laughed. Chapter 6 Half an hour later she walked, leaning on Keith's arm, down the long central path toward the gate. "'It's been such a short afternoon,' he sighed. "'And I'm so sorry you were sick, Lois.' "'Keith, I'm feeling fine now, really.' I wish you wouldn't worry. Poor old child. I didn't realize that benediction would be a long service for you, after your hot trip out here and all. She laughed cheerfully. I guess the truth is I'm not much used to benediction. Mass is the limit of my religious exertions. She paused and then continued quickly. I don't want to shock you, Keith, but I can't tell you how, how inconvenient being a Catholic is. It really doesn't seem to apply any more. As far as morals go, some of the wildest boys I know are Catholics. And the brightest boys, I mean the ones who think and read a lot, don't seem to believe in much of anything any more. Tell me about it. The bus won't be here for another half hour. They sat down on a bench by the path. For instance, Gerald Carter, he's published a novel. He absolutely roars when people mention immortality. And then how, well, another man I've known well, lately, who was Phi Beta Kappa at Harvard, says that no intelligent person can believe in supernatural Christianity. He says Christ was a great socialist, though. Am I shocking you? She broke off suddenly. Keith smiled. You can't shock a monk. He's a professional shock absorber. Well she continued. That's about all. It seems so, so narrow. Church schools, for instance. There's more freedom about things that Catholic people can't see. Like birth control. Keith winced, almost imperceptibly, but Lois saw it. Oh, she said quickly, everybody talks about everything now. It's probably better that way. Oh, yes, much better. Well, that's all, Keith. I just wanted to tell you why I'm a little lukewarm at present. I'm not shocked, Lois. I understand better than you think. We all go through those times. But I know it'll come out all right, child. There's that gift of faith that we have, you and I, that'll carry us past the bad spots. He rose as he spoke, and they started again down the path. I want you to pray for me sometimes, Lois. 
I think your prayers would be about what I need, because we've come very close in these few hours, I think. Her eyes were suddenly shining. Oh, we have, we have, she cried. I feel closer to you now than to anyone in the world. He stopped suddenly and indicated the side of the path. We might, just a minute. It was a pieta, a life-size statue of the Blessed Virgin, set within a semicircle of rocks. Feeling a little self-conscious, she dropped on her knees beside him and made an unsuccessful attempt at prayer. She was only half through when he rose. He took her arm again. I wanted to thank her for letting us have this day together, he said simply. Lois felt a sudden lump in her throat, and she wanted to say something that would tell him how much it had meant to her, too, but she found no words. I'll always remember this, he continued, his voice trembling a little. This summer day with you. It's been just what I expected. You're just what I expected, Lois. I'm awfully glad, Keith. You see, when you were little, they kept sending me snapshots of you, first as a baby, and then as a child in socks, playing on the beach with a pail and shovel, and then suddenly as a wistful little girl with wondering, pure eyes. And I used to build dreams about you. A man has to have something living to cling to. I think, Lois, it was your little white soul I tried to keep near me, even when life was at its loudest, and every intellectual idea of God seemed the sheerest mockery, and desire and love and a million things came up to me and said, Look here at me. See, I'm life. You're turning your back on it. All the way through that shadow, Lois, I could always see your baby soul flitting on ahead of me, very frail and clear and wonderful. Lois was crying softly. They had reached the gate, and she rested her elbow on it and dabbed furiously at her eyes. And then later, child, when you were sick, I knelt all one night and asked God to spare you for me, for I knew then that I wanted more. He had taught me to want more. I wanted to know you moved and breathed in the same world with me. I saw you growing up, that white innocence of yours changing to a flame and burning to give light to other weaker souls. And then I wanted some day to take your children on my knee and hear them call the crabbed old monk Uncle Keith. He seemed to be laughing now as he talked. Oh, Lois, Lois, I was asking God for more then. I wanted the letters you'd write me and the place I'd have at your table. I wanted an awful lot, Lois, dear. You've got me, Keith, she sobbed. You know it. Say you know it. Oh, I'm acting like a baby, but I didn't think you'd be this way, and I... Oh, Keith, Keith. He took her hand and patted it softly. Here's the bus. You'll come again, won't you? She put her hands on his cheeks, and drawing his head down, pressed her tear-wet face against his. Oh, Keith, brother, some day I'll tell you something. He helped her in, saw her take down her handkerchief, and smile bravely at him as the driver flicked his whip and the bus rolled off. Then a thick cloud of dust rose around it, and she was gone. For a few minutes he stood there on the road, his hand on the gatepost, his lips half parted in a smile. Lois, he said aloud in a sort of wonder. Lois, Lois. Later, some probationers passing noticed him kneeling before the Pieta, and coming back after a time found him still there, and he was there until twilight came down and the courteous trees grew garrulous overhead, and the crickets took up their burden of song in the dusky grass. CHAPTER Seven. The first clerk in the telegraph booth in the Baltimore station whistled through his buck teeth at the second clerk. "'S matter?' See that girl? No, the pretty one, with the big black dots on her veil. Too late. She's gone. You missed some. What about her? Nothing, except she's damn good looking. Came in here yesterday and sent a wire to some guy to meet her somewhere. Then a minute ago she came in with a telegram, all written out, 
and was standing there going to give it to me, when she changed her mind or something, and all of a sudden tore it up. Hmm. The first clerk came around the counter, and picking up the two pieces of paper from the floor, put them together idly. The second clerk read them over his shoulder, and subconsciously counted the words as he read. There were just thirteen. This is in the way of a permanent good-bye. I should suggest Italy. Lois. Tore it up, eh? said the second clerk. End of Benediction by F. Scott Fitzgerald Part 1 of The Camel's Back This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden The Camel's Back by F. Scott Fitzgerald Part 1 Introduction I suppose that of all the stories I have ever written, this one cost me the least travail, and perhaps gave me the most amusement. As to the labor involved, it was written during one day in the city of New Orleans, with the express purpose of buying a platinum and diamond wristwatch which cost six hundred dollars. I began it at seven in the morning, and finished it at two o'clock the same night. It was published in the Saturday Evening Post in 1920 and later included in the O. Henry Memorial Collection for the same year. I like it least of all the stories in this volume. My amusement was derived from the fact that the camel part of the story is literally true. In fact, I have a standing engagement with the gentleman involved to attend the next fancy dress party to which we are mutually invited, attired as the latter part of the camel. This is a sort of atonement for being his historian. End of the Introduction The Camel's Back The glazed eye of the tired reader, resting for a second on the above title, will presume it to be merely metaphorical. Stories about the cup and the lip and the bad penny and the new broom rarely have anything to do with cups or lips or pennies or brooms. This story is the exception. It has to do with a material, visible, and large-as-life camel's back. Starting from the neck, we shall work toward the tail. I want you to meet Mr. Perry Parkhurst, 28, lawyer, native of Toledo. Perry has nice teeth, a Harvard diploma, parts his hair in the middle. You have met him before, in Cleveland, Portland, St. Paul, Indianapolis, Kansas City, and so forth. Baker Brothers, New York, pause on their semi-annual trip through the West to clothe him. Montmorency and Company dispatch a young man post-haste every three months to see that he has the correct number of little punctures on his shoes. He has a domestic roadster now, will have a French roadster if he lives long enough, and doubtless a Chinese tank if it comes into fashion. He looks like the advertisement of the young man rubbing his sunset-colored chest with liniment and goes east every other year to his class reunion. I want you to meet his love. Her name is Betty Medill, and she would take well in the movies. Her father gives her three hundred a month to dress on, and she has tawny eyes and hair and feather fans of five colors. I shall also introduce her father, Cyrus Medill. Though he is to all appearances flesh and blood, he is, strange to say, commonly known in Toledo as the Aluminum Man. But when he sits in his club window with two or three iron men, and the white pine man, and the brass man, they look very much as you and I do, only more so, if you know what I mean. Now, during the Christmas holidays of 1919, there took place in Toledo, counting only the people with the italicized the, 41 dinner parties, 16 dances, 6 luncheons, male and female, 12 teas, 4 stag dinners, 2 weddings, and thirteen bridge parties. It was the cumulative effect of all this that moved Perry Parkhurst on the twenty-ninth day of December to a decision. This Medill girl would marry him, and she wouldn't marry him. She was having such a good time that she hated to take such a definite step. Meanwhile, their secret engagement had got so long that it seemed as if any day it might break off of its own weight. A little man named Warburton, who knew it all, persuaded Perry to superman her to get a marriage license and go up to the Medill house and tell her she'd have to marry him at once or call it off forever. So he presented himself, 
his heart, his license, and his ultimatum. And within five minutes they were in the midst of a violent quarrel, a burst of sporadic open fighting such as occurs near the end of all long wars and engagements. It brought about one of those ghastly lapses in which two people who are in love pull up sharp, look at each other coolly, and think it's all been a mistake. Afterward they usually kiss wholesomely and assure the other person it was all their fault. Say it was all my fault. Say it was. I want to hear you say it. But while reconciliation was trembling in the air, while each was, in a measure, stalling it off, so that they might the more voluptuously and sentimentally enjoy it when it came, they were permanently interrupted by a twenty-minute phone call for Betty from a garrulous aunt. At the end of eighteen minutes, Perry Parkhurst, urged on by pride and suspicion and injured dignity, put on his long fur coat, picked up his light brown soft hat, and stalked out the door. "'It's all over,' he muttered brokenly as he tried to jam his car into first. "'It's all over. If I have to choke you for an hour, damn you!' This last to the car, which had been standing some time and was quite cold. He drove downtown, that is, he got into a snow rut that led him downtown. He sat slouched down very low in his seat, much too dispirited to care where he went. In front of the Clarendon Hotel he was hailed from the sidewalk by a bad man named Bailey, who had big teeth and lived at the hotel and had never been in love. Perry, said the bad man softly, when the roadster drew up beside him at the curb, I've got six quarts of the doggondest still champagne you ever tasted. A third of it's yours, Perry, if you'll come upstairs and help Martin Macy and me drink it. Bailey, said Perry tensely, I'll drink your champagne. I'll drink every drop of it. I don't care if it kills me. Shut up, you nut, said the bad man gently. They don't put wood alcohol in champagne. This is the stuff that proves the world is more than six thousand years old. It's so ancient that the cork is petrified. You'll have to pull it with a stone drill. Take me upstairs, said Perry moodily. If that cork sees my heart, it'll fall out from pure mortification. The room upstairs was full of those innocent hotel pictures of little girls eating apples and sitting in swings and talking to dogs. The other decorations were neckties and a pink man reading a pink paper devoted to ladies in pink tights. "'When you have to go into the highways and byways,' said the pink man, looking reproachfully at Bailey and Perry. "'Hello, Martin Macy,' said Perry shortly. "'Where's this Stone Age champagne?' "'What's the rush? This isn't an operation, understand. This is a party.' Perry sat down dully and looked disapprovingly at all the neckties. Bailey leisurely opened the door of a wardrobe and brought out six handsome bottles. "'Take off that darn fur coat,' said Martin Macy to Perry. "'Or maybe you'd like to have us open all the windows.' "'Give me champagne,' said Perry. "'Going to the Townsend's Circus Ball tonight?' "'Am not.' "'Vited?' Uh-huh. Why not go? Oh, I'm sick of parties, exclaimed Perry. I'm sick of them. I've been to so many that I'm sick of them. Maybe you're going to the Howard Tate's party. No, I tell you, I'm sick of them. Well, said Macy consolingly, the Tate's is just for college kids anyways. I tell you, I thought you'd be going to one of them anyways. I see by the papers you haven't missed a one this Christmas. Hm, grunted Perry morosely. He would never go to any more parties. Classical phrases played in his mind. That side of his life was closed, closed. Now when a man says closed, closed like that, you can be pretty sure that some woman has double-closed him, so to speak. Perry was also thinking that other classical thought about how cowardly suicide is. A noble thought, that one, warm and inspiring. Think of all the fine men we should lose if suicide were not so cowardly. An hour later was six o'clock, and Perry had lost all resemblance to the young man in the liniment advertisement. He looked like a rough draft for a riotous cartoon. They were singing, 
an impromptu song of Bailey's improvisation. One Lump Perry, the parlor snake, famous through the city for the way he drinks his tea, plays with it, toys with it, makes no noise with it, balanced on a napkin on his well-trained knee. "'Trouble is,' said Perry, who had just banged his hair with Bailey's comb and was tying an orange tie round it to get the effect of Julius Caesar, "'that you fellows can't sing worth a damn. Soon's I leave the air and start singing tenor, you start singing tenor too.' "'I'm a natural tenor,' said Macy gravely. "'Voice lacks cultivation, that's all. "'Got a natural voice, my aunt used to say. "'Naturally good singer.' "'Singers, singers, all good singers,' remarked Bailey, who was at the telephone. "'No, not the cabaret. I want night egg. "'I mean some doggone clerk that's got food. Food! I want—' "'Julius Caesar,' announced Perry, turning round from the mirror. "'Man of iron will and stern termination.' "'Shut up!' yelled Bailey. "'Say, it's Mr. Bailey. Send up enormous supper. Use yon judgment. Right away.' He connected the receiver in the hook with some difficulty, and then, with his lips closed and an expression of solemn intensity in his eyes, went to the lower drawer of his dresser and pulled it open. "'Look it,' he commanded. In his hands he held a truncated garment of pink gingham. "'Pants!' he exclaimed gravely. Look it. This was a pink blouse, a red tie, and a buster brown collar. Look it, he repeated. Costume for the Townsend Circus Ball. I'm a little boy carries water for the elephants. Perry was impressed in spite of himself. I'm going to be Julius Caesar, he announced after a moment of concentration. Thought you weren't going, said Macy. Me? Sure, I'm going. Never miss a party. Good for the nerves, like celery. Caesar, scoffed Bailey. Can't be Caesar. He is not about a circus. Caesar's Shakespeare. Go as a clown. Perry shook his head. Nope. Caesar. Caesar? Sure. Chariot. Light dawned on Bailey. That's right. Good idea. Perry looked round the room searchingly. "'You lend me a bathrobe and this tie,' he said finally. Bailey considered. "'No good.' "'Sure, that's all I need. Caesar was a savage. They can't kick if I come as Caesar if he was a savage.' "'No,' said Bailey, shaking his head slowly. "'Get a costume over at a costumer's. Over at Nolak's.' closed up. Find out. After a puzzling five minutes at the phone, a small, weary voice managed to convince Perry that it was Mr. Nolak speaking, and that they would remain open until eight because of the Townsend's ball. Thus assured, Perry ate a great amount of filet mignon and drank his third of the last bottle of champagne. At eight-fifteen, the man in the tall hat, who stands in front of the Clarendon, found him trying to start his roadster. "'Froze up,' said Perry, wisely. "'The cold froze it. The cold air.' "'Froze, eh?' "'Yes, cold air froze it.' "'Can't start it?' "'Nope. Let it stand here till summer. "'One of those hot old August days will thaw it out all right.' "'Go and let it stand?' "'Sure, let her stand. Take a hot thief to steal it. Give me taxi.' The man in the tall hat summoned a taxi. "'Where to, mister?' "'Go to Nolak's, costume fella.'" Chapter 2 Mrs. Nolak was short and ineffectual-looking, and on the cessation of the World War had belonged for a while to one of the new nationalities. Owing to unsettled European conditions, she had never since been quite sure what she was. The shop in which she and her husband performed their daily stint was dim and ghostly, and peopled with suits of armor and Chinese mandarins, and enormous papier-mâché birds suspended from the ceiling. In a vague background, many rows of masks glared eyelessly at the visitor. 
and there were glass cases full of crowns and scepters, and jewels and enormous stomachers, and paints and crepe hair, and wigs of all colors. When Perry ambled into the shop, Mrs. Nolak was folding up the last troubles of a strenuous day, so she thought, in a drawer full of pink silk stockings. "'Something for you?' she queried, pessimistically. "'Want costume of Julius Her, the charioteer.' Mrs. Nolak was sorry, but every stitch of charioteer had been rented long ago. Was it for the Townsend's circus ball? It was. Sorry, she said, but I don't think there's anything left that's really circus. This was an obstacle. Hmm, said Perry. An idea struck him suddenly. If you've got a piece of canvas, I could go as a tent. Sorry, but we haven't anything like that. A hardware store is where you'd have to go. We have some very nice Confederate soldiers. No, no soldiers. And I have a very handsome king. He shook his head. Several of the gentlemen, she continued, hopefully, are wearing stovepipe hats and swallowtail coats and going as ringmasters, but we're all out of tall hats. I can let you have some crepe hair for a mustache. Won't something stinctive? Something, let's see, well, we have a lion's head, and a goose, and a camel. Camel? The idea seized Perry's imagination, gripped it fiercely. Yes, but it needs two people. Camel, that's the idea. Let me see it. The camel was produced from his resting place on a top shelf. At first glance he appeared to consist entirely of a very gaunt, cadaverous head and a sizable hump. But on being spread out, he was found to possess a dark brown, unwholesome-looking body made of thick, cottony cloth. "'You see, it takes two people,' explained Mrs. Nolak, holding the camel in frank admiration. "'If you have a friend, he could be part of it. You see, there's sort of pants for two people. One pair is for the fella in front, and the other pair for the fella in back. The fella in front does the looking out through these here eyes, and the fella in back—' He just got to stoop over and follow the front fella round. "'Put it on,' commanded Perry. Obediently, Mrs. Nolak put her tabby-cat face inside the camel's head and turned it from side to side ferociously. Perry was fascinated. "'What noise does a camel make?' "'What?' asked Mrs. Nolak, as her face emerged somewhat smudgy. "'Oh, what noise?' What he sort of brays. Let me see it in a mirror. Before a wide mirror, Perry tried on the head and turned from side to side appraisingly. In the dim light, the effect was distinctly pleasing. The camel's face was a study in pessimism, decorated with numerous abrasions, and it must be admitted that his coat was in that state of general negligence peculiar to camels. In fact, he needed to be cleaned and pressed. But distinctive he certainly was. He was majestic. He would have attracted attention in any gathering, if only by his melancholy cast of feature and the look of hunger lurking round his shadowy eyes. "'You see, you have to have two people,' said Mrs. Nolak again. Perry tentatively gathered up the body and legs and wrapped them about him, tying the hind legs as a girdle round his waist. The effect on the whole was bad. It was even irreverent like one of those medieval pictures of a monk changed into a beast by the ministrations of Satan. At the very best, the ensemble resembled a hump-backed cow sitting on her haunches among blankets. "'Don't look like anything at all,' objected Perry gloomily. "'No,' said Mrs. Nolak. "'You see, you got to have two people.' A solution flashed upon Perry. "'You got a date tonight?' "'Oh, I couldn't possibly.' "'Oh, come on,' said Perry encouragingly. "'Sure you can. "'Here, be good sport and climb into these hind legs.' With difficulty he located them and extended their yawning depths ingratiatingly. But Mrs. Nolak seemed loath. She backed perversely away. "'Oh, no.' "'Come on, you can be the front if you want to, "'or we'll flip a coin. "'Make it worth your while.' Mrs. Nolak set her lips firmly together. "'Now you just stop,' 
she said, with no coyness implied. None of the gentlemen ever acted up this way before. My husband— You got a husband? demanded Perry. Where is he? He's home. Was telephone number. After considerable parley, he obtained the telephone number pertaining to the Nolak Penates, and got into communication with that small, weary voice he had heard once before that day. But Mr. Nolak, though taken off his guard and somewhat confused by Perry's brilliant flow of logic, stuck staunchly to his point. He refused firmly, but with dignity, to help out Mr. Parkhurst in the capacity of back part of a camel. Having rung off, or rather having been rung off on, Perry sat down on a three-legged stool to think it over. He named over to himself those friends on whom he might call, and then his mind paused as Betty Medill's name hazily and sorrowfully occurred to him. He had a sentimental thought. He would ask her. Their love affair was over, but she could not refuse this last request. Surely it was not much to ask, to help him keep up his end of social obligation for one short night. And if she insisted, she could be the front part of the camel, and he would go as the back. His magnanimity pleased him. His mind even turned to rosy-colored dreams of a tender reconciliation inside the camel, there, hidden away from all the world. "'Now you'd better decide right off.' The bourgeois voice of Mrs. Nolak broke in upon his mellow fancies and roused him to action. He went to the phone and called up the Medill house. Miss Betty was out, had gone out to dinner. Then, when all seemed lost, the camel's back wandered curiously into the store. He was a dilapidated individual with a cold in his head and a general trend about him of downwardness. His cap was pulled down low on his head, and his chin was pulled down low on his chest. His coat hung down to his shoes. He looked run down, down at the heels, and, Salvation Army to the contrary, down and out. He said that he was the taxicab driver that the gentleman had hired at the Clarendon Hotel. He had been instructed to wait outside, but he had waited some time, and a suspicion had grown upon him that the gentleman had gone out the back way with purpose to defraud him gentlemen sometimes did. So he had come in. He sank down onto the three-legged stool. "'Want to go to a party?' demanded Perry sternly. "'I gotta work,' answered the taxi-driver lugubriously. "'I gotta keep my job.' "'It's a very good party.' "'It's a very good job.' "'Come on,' urged Perry." Be a good fella. See, it's pretty. He held the camel up, and the taxi driver looked at it cynically. Huh. Perry searched feverishly among the folds of the cloth. See, he cried enthusiastically, holding up a selection of folds. This is your part. You don't even have to talk. All you have to do is to walk and sit down occasionally. You do all the sitting down. Think of it. I'm on my feet all the time, and you can sit down some of the time. The only time I can sit down is when we're lying down, and you can sit down when, oh, any time. See? What's that thing? demanded the individual dubiously. A shroud? Not at all, said Perry indignantly. It's a camel. Huh? Then Perry mentioned a sum of money, and the conversation left the land of grunts and assumed a practical tinge. Perry and the taxi driver tried on the camel in front of the mirror. "'You can't see it,' explained Perry, peering anxiously out through the eye-holes. "'But honestly, old man, you look simply great. Honestly.' A grunt from the hump acknowledged this somewhat dubious compliment. "'Honestly, you look great.' repeated Perry enthusiastically. Move round a little. The hind legs moved forward, giving the effect of a huge cat camel hunching his back preparatory to a spring. No, move sideways. The camel's hips went neatly out of joint. A hula dancer would have writhed in envy. Good, isn't it? demanded Perry, turning to Mrs. Nolak for approval. It looks lovely, agreed Mrs. Nolak. "'We'll take it,' said Perry. 
The bundle was stowed under Perry's arm, and they left the shop. "'Go to the party,' he commanded as he took his seat in the back. "'What party?' "'Fancy dress party.' "'Whereabouts is it?' This presented a new problem. Perry tried to remember, but the names of all those who had given parties during the holidays danced confusedly before his eyes. He could ask Mrs. Nolak, but on looking out the window he saw that the shop was dark. Mrs. Nolak had already faded out, a little black smudge far down the snowy street. "'Drive up town,' directed Perry, with fine confidence. "'If you see a party, stop. Otherwise I'll tell you when we get there.' He fell into a hazy daydream, and his thoughts wandered again to Betty. He imagined vaguely that they had had a disagreement because she refused to go to the party as the back part of the camel. He was just slipping off into a chilly doze when he was wakened by the taxi driver opening the door and shaking him by the arm. "'Here we are. Maybe.' Perry looked out sleepily. A striped awning led from the curb up to a spreading gray stone house from which issued the low, drummy whine of expensive jazz. He recognized the Howard Tate house. "'Sure,' he said emphatically. "'That's it. Tate's party tonight. "'Sure, everybody's going.' "'Say,' said the individual anxiously, after another look at the awning, "'you sure these people ain't gonna romp on me for coming here?' Perry drew himself up with dignity. If anybody says anything to you, you just tell them you're part of my costume. The visualization of himself as a thing rather than a person seemed to reassure the individual. All right, he said reluctantly. Perry stepped out under the shelter of the awning and began unrolling the camel. Let's go, he commanded. Several minutes later, a melancholy, hungry-looking camel, emitting clouds of smoke from his mouth, and from the tip of his noble hump, might have been seen crossing the threshold of the Howard Tate residence, passing a startled footman without so much as a snort, and heading directly for the main stairs that led up to the ballroom. The beast walked with a peculiar gait which varied between an uncertain lockstep and a stampede, but can best be described by the word halting. The camel had a halting gait, and as he walked he alternately elongated and contracted like a gigantic concertina. End of Part 1。Part 2 of The Camel's Back。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Camel's Back – by F. Scott Fitzgerald, Part Two. Chapter Three. The Howard Tates are, as every one who lives in Toledo knows, the most formidable people in town. Mrs. Howard Tate was a Chicago Todd before she became a Toledo Tate, and the family generally affect that conscious simplicity which has begun to be the earmark of American aristocracy. The Tates have reached the stage where they talk about pigs and farms, and look at you icy-eyed if you are not amused. They have begun to prefer retainers rather than friends as dinner guests, spend a lot of money in a quiet way, and, having lost all sense of competition, are in process of growing quite dull. The dance this evening was for little Millicent Tate, and though all ages were represented, the dancers were mostly from school and college. The younger married crowd was at the Townsend Circus Ball, up at the Tally Ho Club. Mrs. Tate was standing just inside the ballroom, following Millicent round with her eyes, and beaming whenever she caught her eye. Beside her were two middle-aged sycophants, who were saying what a perfectly exquisite child Millicent was. It was at this moment that Mrs. Tate was grasped firmly by the skirt, and her youngest daughter, Emily, aged eleven, hurled herself with an oof into her mother's arms. "'Why, Emily, what's the trouble?' "'Mama,' said Emily, wild-eyed but voluble, "'there's something out on the stairs.' "'What?' "'There's a thing out on the stairs, Mama. I think it's a big dog, Mama, but it doesn't look like a dog.' "'What do you mean, Emily?' The sycophants waved their heads sympathetically. "'Mama, it looks like a... 
like a camel. Mrs. Tate laughed. You saw a mean old shadow, dear, that's all. No, I didn't. No, it was some kind of thing, Mama. Big. I was going downstairs to see if there were any more people, and this dog or something, he was coming upstairs. Kind of funny, Mama, like he was lame. And then he saw me and gave a sort of growl, and then he slipped at the top of the landing, and I ran. Mrs. Tate's laugh faded. The child must have seen something, she said. The sycophants agreed that the child must have seen something, and suddenly all three women took an instinctive step away from the door, as the sounds of muffled steps were audible just outside. And then three startled gasps rang out, as a dark brown form rounded the corner, and they saw what was apparently a huge beast looking down at them hungrily. Oof! cried Mrs. Tate. Ooh! cried the ladies in a chorus. The camel suddenly humped his back, and the gasp turned to shrieks. Oh, look! What is it? The dancing stopped, but the dancers, hurrying over, got quite a different impression of the invader. In fact, the young people immediately suspected that it was a stunt, a hired entertainer come to amuse the party. The boys in long trousers looked at it rather disdainfully, and sauntered over with their hands in their pockets, feeling that their intelligence was being insulted but the girls uttered little shouts of glee. It's a camel. Well, if he isn't the funniest. The camel stood there uncertainly, swaying slightly from side to side, and seeming to take in the room in a careful, appraising glance. Then, as if he had come to an abrupt decision, he turned and ambled swiftly out the door. Mr. Howard Tate had just come out of the library on the lower floor, and was standing chatting with a young man in the hall. Suddenly they heard the noise of shouting upstairs, and almost immediately a succession of bumping sounds, followed by the precipitous appearance at the foot of the stairway of a large brown beast that seemed to be going somewhere in a great hurry. "'Now, what the devil!' said Mr. Tate, starting. The beast picked itself up, not without dignity, and, affecting an air of extreme nonchalance, as if he had just remembered an important engagement, started at a mixed gait toward the front door. In fact, his front legs began casually to run. "'See here now,' said Mr. Tate sternly. "'Here, grab it, Butterfield, grab it!' The young man enveloped the rear of the camel in a pair of compelling arms, and realizing that further locomotion was impossible, the front end submitted to capture, and stood resignedly in a state of some agitation. By this time a flood of young people was pouring downstairs, and Mr. Tate, suspecting everything from an ingenious burglar to an escaped lunatic, gave crisp directions to the young man. "'Hold him. Lead him in here. We'll soon see.' The camel consented to be led into the library, and Mr. Tate, after locking the door, took a revolver from a table drawer and instructed the young man to take the thing's head off. Then he gasped and returned the revolver to its hiding place. "'Well, Perry Parkhurst!' he exclaimed in amazement. "'Got the wrong party, Mr. Tate,' said Perry sheepishly. "'Hope I didn't scare you.' "'Well, you gave us a thrill, Perry.' Realization dawned on him. "'You're bound for the Townsend Circus Ball.' "'That's the general idea.' "'Let me introduce Mr. Butterfield, Mr. Parkhurst.' Then turning to Perry, "'Butterfield is staying with us for a few days.' "'I got a little mixed up,' mumbled Perry. "'I'm very sorry.' "'Perfectly all right. Most natural mistake in the world. I've got a clown rig, and I'm going down there myself after a while.' He turned to Butterfield. "'Better change your mind and come down with us.' The young man demurred. He was going to bed.' "'Have a drink, Perry?' suggested Mr. Tate. "'Thanks, I will.' "'And say,' continued Tate quickly, "'I'd forgotten all about your friend here.' He indicated the rear part of the camel. "'I didn't mean to seem discourteous. "'Is it anyone I know? "'Bring him out.' "'It's not a friend,' explained Perry hurriedly. "'I just rented him.' "'Does he drink?' "'Do you?' demanded Perry, twisting himself tortuously round. 
There was a faint sound of assent. "'Sure he does,' said Mr. Tate heartily. "'A really efficient camel ought to be able to drink enough so it last him three days.' "'Tell you,' said Perry anxiously, "'he isn't exactly dressed up enough to come out. "'If you give me the bottle, I can hand it back to him, "'and he can take his inside.' From under the cloth was audible the enthusiastic smacking sound inspired by this suggestion. When a butler had appeared with bottles, glasses, and siphon, one of the bottles was handed back. Thereafter the silent partner could be heard imbibing long potations at frequent intervals. Thus passed a benign hour. At ten o'clock Mr. Tate decided that they'd better be starting. He donned his clown's costume, Perry replaced the camel's head, and side by side they traversed on foot the single block between the Tate House and the Tally Ho Club. The circus ball was in full swing. A great tent fly had been put up inside the ballroom, and round the walls had been built rows of booths representing the various attractions of a circus side show, but these were now vacated, and over the floor swarmed a shouting, laughing medley of youth and color. Clowns, bearded ladies, acrobats, bareback riders, ringmasters, tattooed men, and charioteers. The Townsends had determined to assure their party of success, so a great quantity of liquor had been surreptitiously brought over from their house, and was now flowing freely. A green ribbon ran along the wall, completely round the ballroom, with pointing arrows alongside, and signs which instructed the uninitiated to follow the green line. The green line led down to the bar, where waited pure punch and wicked punch and plain dark green bottles. On the wall above the bar was another arrow, red and very wavy, and under it the slogan, Now follow this. But even amid the luxury of costume and high spirits represented there, the entrance of the camel created something of a stir, and Perry was immediately surrounded by a curious, laughing crowd attempting to penetrate the identity of this beast that stood by the wide doorway, eyeing the dancers with his hungry, melancholy gaze. And then Perry saw Betty standing in front of a booth, talking to a comic policeman. She was dressed in the costume of an Egyptian snake charmer. Her tawny hair was braided and drawn through brass rings, the effect crowned with a glittering oriental tiara. Her fair face was stained to a warm olive glow, and on her arms and the half-moon of her back writhed painted serpents with single eyes of venomous green. Her feet were in sandals, and her skirt was slit to the knees, so that when she walked one caught a glimpse of other slim serpents painted just above her bare ankles. Wound about her neck was a glittering cobra, altogether a charming costume one that caused the more nervous among the older women to shrink away from her when she passed, and the more troublesome ones to make great talk about shouldn't be allowed and perfectly disgraceful. But Perry, peering through the uncertain eyes of the camel, saw only her face, radiant, animated, and glowing with excitement, and her arms and shoulders, whose mobile, expressive gestures made her always the outstanding figure in any group. He was fascinated, and his fascination exercised a sobering effect on him. With a growing clarity the events of the day came back. Rage rose within him, and with a half-formed intention of taking her away from the crowd, he started toward her, or rather he elongated slightly, for he had neglected to issue the preparatory command necessary to locomotion. But at this point Fickle Kismet, who for a day had played with him bitterly and sardonically, decided to reward him in full for the amusement he had afforded her. Kismet turned the tawny eyes of the snake-charmer to the camel. Kismet led her to lean toward the man beside her and say, "'Who's that, that camel?' "'Darned if I know.' But a little man named Warburton, who knew it all, found it necessary to hazard an opinion. "'It came in with Mr. Tate.' I think part of it's probably Warren Butterfield, the architect from New York, who's visiting the Tates. Something stirred in Betty Medill, that age-old interest of the provincial girl in the visiting man. Oh, she said casually, after a slight pause. At the end of the next dance, Betty and her partner finished up within a few feet of the camel. With the informal audacity that was the keynote of the evening, she reached out and gently rubbed the camel's nose. "'Hello, old camel.' 
the camel stirred uneasily. "'You afraid of me?' said Betty, lifting her eyebrows in reproof. "'Don't be. You see I'm a snake-charmer, but I'm pretty good at camels, too.' The camel bowed very low, and someone made the obvious remark about beauty and the beast. Mrs. Townsend approached the group. "'Well, Mr. Butterfield,' she said helpfully, "'I wouldn't have recognized you.' Perry bowed again, and smiled gleefully behind his mask. "'And who is this with you?' she inquired. "'Oh,' said Perry, his voice muffled by the thick cloth and quite unrecognizable. He isn't a fellow, Mrs. Townsend. He's just part of my costume. Mrs. Townsend laughed and moved away. Perry turned again to Betty. So, he thought, this is how much she cares. On the very day of our final rupture, she starts a flirtation with another man, an absolute stranger. On an impulse, he gave her a soft nudge with his shoulder, and waved his head suggestively toward the hall, making it clear that he desired her to leave her partner and accompany him. "'Bye-bye, Russ,' she called to her partner. "'This old camel's got me. Where are we going, prince of beasts?' The noble animal made no rejoinder, but stalked gravely along in the direction of a secluded nook on the side stairs. There she seated herself and the camel, after some seconds of confusion, which included gruff orders and sounds of a heated dispute going on in his interior, placed himself beside her, his hind legs stretching out uncomfortably across two steps. "'Well, old egg,' said Betty cheerfully, "'how do you like our happy party?' The old egg indicated that he liked it by rolling his head ecstatically and executing a gleeful kick with his hoofs. This is the first time that I ever had a tete-a-tete -tete with a man's valet round, she pointed to the hind legs, or whatever that is. Oh, mumbled Perry, he's deaf and blind. I should think you'd feel rather handicapped. You can't very well toddle, even if you want to. The camel hung his head lugubriously. I wish you'd say something, continued Betty sweetly. Say you like me, Camel. Say you think I'm beautiful. Say you'd like to belong to a pretty snake charmer. The Camel would. Will you dance with me, Camel? The Camel would try. Betty devoted half an hour to the Camel. She devoted at least half an hour to all visiting men. It was usually sufficient. When she approached a new man, the current debutantes were accustomed to scatter right and left like a close column deploying before a machine-gun. And so to Perry Parkhurst was awarded the unique privilege of seeing his love as others saw her. He was flirted with violently. CHAPTER Four. This paradise of frail foundation was broken into by the sounds of a general ingress to the ballroom. The cotillion was beginning. Betty and the camel joined the crowd, her brown hand resting lightly on his shoulder, defiantly symbolizing her complete adoption of him. When they entered, the couples were already seating themselves at tables round the walls, and Mrs. Townsend, resplendent as a super bareback rider, with rather two rotund calves, was standing in the center with the ringmaster in charge of arrangements. At a signal to the band, everyone rose and began to dance. "'Isn't it just slick?' sighed Betty. "'Do you think you can possibly dance?' Perry nodded enthusiastically. He felt suddenly exuberant. After all, he was here incognito, talking to his love. He could wink patronizingly at the world. So Perry danced the cotillion. I say danced, but that is stretching the word far beyond the wildest dreams of the jazziest Terpsichorean. He suffered his partner to put her hands on his helpless shoulders, and pull him here and there over the floor, while he hung his huge head docilely over her shoulder, and made futile dummy motions with his feet. His hind legs danced in a manner all their own, chiefly by hopping first on one foot and then on the other. Never being sure whether dancing was going on or not, the hind legs played safe by going through a series of steps whenever the music started playing. So the spectacle was frequently presented of the front part of the camel standing at ease, and the rear keeping up a constant energetic motion calculated to rouse a sympathetic perspiration in any soft-hearted observer. 
He was frequently favored. He danced first with a tall lady covered with straw, who announced jovially that she was a bale of hay, and coyly begged him not to eat her. "'I'd like to, you're so sweet,' said the camel gallantly. Each time the ringmaster shouted his call of, "'Men up!' He lumbered ferociously for Betty, with the cardboard wienerwurst, or the photograph of the bearded lady, or whatever the favor chanced to be. Sometimes he reached her first, but usually his rushes were unsuccessful and resulted in intense interior arguments. "'For heaven's sake!' Perry would snarl fiercely between his clenched teeth. "'Get a little pep. I could have gotten her that time if you'd picked your feet up.' "'Well, give me a little warning.' "'I did, darn you!' I can't see a doggone thing in here. All you have to do is follow me. It's just like dragging a load of sand round to walk with you. Maybe you want to try back here. You shut up. If these people found you in this room, they'd give you the worst beating you ever had. They'd take your taxi license away from you. Perry surprised himself by the ease with which he made this monstrous threat, but it seemed to have a soporific influence on his companion for he gave out an, oh, go on, and subsided into abashed silence. The ringmaster mounted to the top of the piano and waved his hand for silence. Prizes, he cried. Gather round. Yay, prizes! Self-consciously the circle swayed forward. The rather pretty girl who had mustered the nerve to come as a bearded lady trembled with excitement, thinking to be rewarded for an evening's hideousness. The man who had spent the afternoon having tattoo marks painted on him skulked on the edge of the crowd, blushing furiously when anyone told him he was sure to get it. "'Lady and gent performers of this circus,' announced the ringmaster jovially, "'I am sure we will all agree that a good time has been had by all. We will now bestow honor where honor is due by bestowing the prizes. Mrs. Townsend has asked me to bestow the prizes.' Now, fellow performers, the first prize is for that lady who has displayed this evening the most striking, becoming, at this point the bearded lady sighed resignedly, and original costume. Here the bale of hay pricked up her ears. Now I am sure that the decision which has been agreed upon will be unanimous with all here present. The first prize goes to Miss Betty Medill, the charming Egyptian snake charmer. There was a burst of applause, chiefly masculine, and Miss Betty Medill, blushing beautifully through her olive paint, was passed up to receive her award. With a tender glance, the ringmaster handed down to her a huge bouquet of orchids. "'And now,' he continued, looking round him, "'the other prize is for that man who has the most amusing and original costume. This prize goes without dispute to a guest in our midst.' A gentleman who is visiting here, but whose stay we all hope will be long and merry. In short, to the noble camel who has entertained us all by his hungry look and his brilliant dancing throughout the evening. He ceased, and there was a violent clapping and yaying, for it was a popular choice. The prize, a large box of cigars, was put aside for the camel, as he was anatomically unable to accept it in person. And now, continued the ringmaster, we will wind up the cotillion with the marriage of mirth to folly. Form for the grand wedding march, the beautiful snake charmer and the noble camel in front. Betty skipped forward cheerily and wound an olive arm round the camel's neck. Behind them formed the procession of little boys, little girls, country jakes, fat ladies, thin men, sword swallowers, wild men of Borneo, and armless wonders, many of them well in their cups, all of them excited and happy, and dazzled by the flow of light and color round them, and by the familiar faces, strangely unfamiliar, under bizarre wigs and barbaric paint. The voluptuous chords of the wedding march, done in blasphemous syncopation, issued in a delirious blend from the trombones and saxophones, and the march began. "'Aren't you glad, Camel?' demanded Betty, sweetly, as they stepped off. "'Aren't you glad we're going to be married, and you're going to belong to the nice snake charmer ever afterward?' The camel's front legs pranced, expressing excessive joy. "'Minister! Minister! Where's the minister?' cried voices out of the revel. "'Who's going to be the clergyman?' 
The head of Jumbo, obese negro, waiter at the tally-ho club for many years, appeared rashly through a half-opened pantry door. "'Oh, Jumbo! Get old Jumbo, he's the fella. Come on, Jumbo, how about marrying us a couple? Yay!' Jumbo was seized by four comedians, stripped of his apron, and escorted to a raised dais at the head of the ball. There his collar was removed and replaced backside forward with ecclesiastical effect. The parade separated into two lines, leaving an aisle for the bride and groom. "'Lawdy, man!' roared Jumbo. "'I got old Bible and everything, show enough!' He produced a battered Bible from an interior pocket. "'Yay, Jumbo's got a Bible! Razor, too, I'll bet!' Together the snake-charmer and the camel ascended the cheering aisle and stopped in front of Jumbo. "'Where's your license, camel?' A man nearby prodded Perry. "'Give him a piece of paper. Anything'll do.' Perry fumbled confusedly in his pocket, found a folded paper, and pushed it out through the camel's mouth. Holding it upside down, Jumbo pretended to scan it earnestly. "'This year's a special camel's license,' he said. "'Get your ring ready, camel.' Inside the camel, Perry turned round and addressed his worse half. "'Give me a ring, for heaven's sake!' "'I ain't got none,' protested a weary voice. "'You have. I saw it. "'I ain't going to take it off in my hand. "'If you don't, I'll kill you.' There was a gasp, and Perry felt a huge affair of rhinestone and brass inserted into his hand. Again he was nudged from the outside. "'Speak up!' "'I do,' cried Perry quickly. He heard Betty's responses given in a debonair tone, and even in this burlesque the sound thrilled him. Then he had pushed the rhinestone through a tear in the camel's coat and was slipping it on her finger, muttering ancient and historic words after Jumbo. He didn't want anyone to know about this, ever. His one idea was to slip away without having to disclose his identity, for Mr. Tate had so far kept his secret well." A dignified young man, Perry, and this might injure his infant law practice. Embrace the bride! Unmask camel and kiss her! Instinctively his heart beat high as Betty turned to him laughingly and began to stroke the cardboard muzzle. He felt his self-control giving way. He longed to surround her with his arms and declare his identity and kiss those lips that smiled only a foot away when suddenly the laughter and applause round them died off, and a curious hush fell over the hall. Perry and Betty looked up in surprise. Jumbo had given vent to a huge, Hello! in such a startled voice that all eyes were bent on him. Hello, he said again. He had turned round the camel's marriage license, which he had been holding upside down, produced spectacles, and was studying it agonizingly. Why? he exclaimed, and in the pervading silence his words were heard plainly by everyone in the room. "'This year's a show enough marriage permit.' "'What? Huh? Say it again, Jumbo. Sure you can read?' Jumbo waved them to silence, and Perry's blood burned a fire in his veins as he realized the break he had made. "'Yes, sir,' repeated Jumbo. This year's a show enough license, and the parties concerned, one of em is this year young lady, Miss Betty Medill, and the others Mr. Perry Parkhurst. There was a general gasp, and a low rumble broke out as all eyes fell on the camel. Betty shrank away from him quickly, her tawny eyes giving out sparks of fury. Is you Mr. Parkhurst, you camel? Perry made no answer. The crowd pressed up closer and stared at him. He stood frozen, rigid with embarrassment, his cardboard face still hungry and sardonic as he regarded the ominous Jumbo. "'Y'all better speak up,' said Jumbo slowly. "'This year's a mighty serious matter. Outside my duties at this club, I happens to be a show enough minister in the First Colored Baptist Church. It done look to me as though y'all is gone and got married.'" Chapter 5 the scene that followed will go down forever in the annals of the tally-ho club. Stout matrons fainted, one hundred percent Americans swore, wild-eyed debutantes babbled in lightning groups instantly formed and instantly dissolved, and a great buzz of chatter, virulent yet oddly subdued, hummed through the chaotic ballroom. 
Feverish youths swore they would kill Perry or Jumbo or themselves or someone, and the Baptist preacher was besieged by a tempestuous covey of clamorous amateur lawyers, asking questions, making threats, demanding precedence, ordering the bonds annulled, and especially trying to ferret out any hint of prearrangement in what had occurred. In the corner, Mrs. Townsend was crying softly on the shoulder of Mr. Howard Tate, who was trying vainly to comfort her. They were exchanging all my faults volubly and voluminously. Outside on a snow-covered walk, Mr. Cyrus Medill, the aluminum man, was being paced slowly up and down between two brawny charioteers, giving vent now to a string of unrepeatables, now to wild pleadings that they'd just let him get at Jumbo. He was facetiously attired for the evening as a wild man of Borneo, and the most exacting stage manager would have acknowledged any improvement in casting the part to be quite impossible. Meanwhile the two principals held the real center of the stage. Betty Medill, or was it Betty Parkhurst, storming furiously, was surrounded by the plainer girls. The prettier ones were too busy talking about her to pay much attention to her and over on the other side of the hall stood the camel, still intact except for his headpiece, which dangled pathetically on his chest. Perry was earnestly engaged in making protestations of his innocence to a ring of angry, puzzled men. Every few minutes, just as he had apparently proved his case, someone would mention the marriage certificate, and the Inquisition would begin again. A girl named Marion Cloud, considered the second-best belle of Toledo, changed the gist of the situation by a remark she made to Betty. "'Well,' she said maliciously, "'it'll all blow over, dear. The courts will annul it without question.' Betty's angry tears dried miraculously in her eyes. Her lips shut tight together, and she looked stonily at Marion. Then she rose and, scattering her sympathizers right and left, walked directly across the room to Perry who stared at her in terror. Again silence crept down upon the room. "'Will you have the decency to grant me five minutes' conversation, or wasn't that included in your plans?' He nodded, his mouth unable to form words. Indicating coldly that he was to follow her, she walked out into the hall with her chin up-tilted and headed for the privacy of one of the little card-rooms. Perry started after her, but was brought to a jerky halt by the failure of his hind legs to function. "'You stay here,' he commanded savagely. "'I can't,' whined a voice from the hump, "'unless you get out first and let me get out.' Perry hesitated, but unable any longer to tolerate the eyes of the curious crowd. He muttered a command, and the camel moved carefully from the room on its four legs. Betty was waiting for him. "'Well,' she began furiously, "'you see what you've done, you and that crazy license. "'I told you you shouldn't have gotten it.' "'My dear girl, I—' "'Don't say dear girl to me. "'Save that for your real wife, "'if you ever get one after this disgraceful performance. "'And don't try to pretend it wasn't all arranged. "'You know you gave that colored waiter money. "'You know you did. "'Do you mean to say you didn't try to marry me?' "'No, of course.' "'Yes, you'd better admit it. You tried it, and now what are you going to do? "'Do you know my father's nearly crazy? "'It'll serve you right if he tries to kill you. "'He'll take his gun and put some cold steel in you. "'Even if this wet, this thing can be annulled, "'it'll hang over me all the rest of my life.' "'Perry could not resist quoting softly. "'Oh, Camel, wouldn't you like to belong to the pretty snake charmer for all your—' "'Shut up!' cried Betty. "'There was a pause.' Betty, said Perry, finally, there's only one thing to do that will really get us out clear. That's for you to marry me. Marry you? Yes, really, it's the only. You shut up. I wouldn't marry you if, if... I know, if I were the last man on earth. But if you care anything about your reputation... Reputation? she cried. You're a nice one to think about my reputation now. Why didn't you think about my reputation before you hired that horrible jumbo to... to... Perry tossed up his hands hopelessly. Very well, I'll do anything you want. Lord knows I renounce all claims. But, said a new voice, I don't. Perry and Betty started, and she put her hand to her heart. For heaven's sake, what was that? It's me, 
said the camel's back. In a minute Perry had whipped off the camel's skin, and a lax, limp object, his clothes hanging on him damply, his hand clenched tightly on an almost empty bottle, stood defiantly before them. "'Oh!' cried Betty. "'You brought that object in here to frighten me. You told me he was deaf, that awful person!' The camel's back sat down on a chair with a sigh of satisfaction. "'Don't talk that way about me, lady. I ain't no person. I'm your husband.' "'Husband!' the cry was wrung simultaneously from Betty and Perry. "'Why, sure, I'm as much your husband as that gink is. The smoke didn't marry you to the camel's front. He married you to the whole camel. Why, that's my ring you got on your finger.' With a little yelp, she snatched the ring from her finger and flung it passionately at the floor. "'What's all this?' demanded Perry dazedly. "'Just that you better fix me and fix me right. If you don't, I'm a-gonna have the same claim you got to being married to her.' "'That's bigamy,' said Perry, turning gravely to Betty. Then came the supreme moment of Perry's evening, the ultimate chance on which he risked his fortunes. He rose and looked first at Betty, where she sat weakly, aghast at this new complication, and then at the individual who swayed from side to side on his chair, uncertainly, menacingly. "'Very well,' said Perry, slowly, to the individual. "'You can have her. Betty, I'm going to prove to you that, as far as I'm concerned, our marriage was entirely accidental. I'm going to renounce utterly my rights to have you as my wife, and give you to—' to the man whose ring you wear, your lawful husband. There was a pause, and four horror-stricken eyes were turned on him. "'Good-bye, Betty,' he said brokenly. "'Don't forget me in your new-found happiness. I'm going to leave for the far west on the morning train. Think of me kindly, Betty.' With a last glance at them, he turned, and his head rested on his chest as his hand touched the doorknob. Goodbye, he repeated. He turned the doorknob. But at this sound, the snakes and silk and tawny hair precipitated themselves violently toward him. Oh, Perry, don't leave me! Perry, Perry, take me with you! Her tears flowed damply on his neck. Calmly, he folded his arms about her. I don't care, she cried. I love you, and if you can wake up a minister at this hour and have it done over again, I'll go west with you. Over her shoulder the front part of the camel looked at the back part of the camel, and they exchanged a particularly subtle, esoteric sort of wink that only true camels can understand. End of The Camel's Back by F. Scott Fitzgerald The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Part 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part 1. Introduction. This story was inspired by a remark of Mark Twain's to the effect that it was a pity that the best part of life came at the beginning and the worst part at the end. By trying the experiment upon only one man in a perfectly normal world, I have scarcely given his idea a fair trial. Several weeks after completing it, I discovered an almost identical plot in Samuel Butler's notebooks. The story was published in Collier's last summer, and provoked this startling letter from an anonymous admirer in Cincinnati. Sir, I have read the story Benjamin Button and Collier's, and I wish to say that as a short story writer you would make a good lunatic. I have seen many pieces of cheese in my life, pieces spelled P-E-I-C-E-S, but of all the pieces of cheese I have ever seen, you are the biggest piece. I hate to waste a piece of stationery on you, but I will. End of the Introduction Chapter 1 as long ago as 1860, it was the proper thing to be born at home. At present, so I am told, the high gods of medicine have decreed that the first cries of the young shall be uttered upon the anesthetic air of a hospital, preferably a fashionable one. 
So young Mr. and Mrs. Roger Button were fifty years ahead of style when they decided, one day in the summer of 1860, that their first baby should be born in a hospital. Whether this anachronism had any bearing upon the astonishing history I am about to set down will never be known. I shall tell you what occurred, and let you judge for yourself. The Roger Buttons held an enviable position, both social and financial, in antebellum Baltimore. They were related to the This Family and the That Family, which, as every Southerner knew, entitled them to membership in that enormous peerage which largely populated the Confederacy. This was their first experience with the charming old custom of having babies. Mr. Button was naturally nervous. He hoped it would be a boy so that he could be sent to Yale College in Connecticut, at which institution Mr. Button himself had been known for four years by the somewhat obvious nickname of Cuff. On the September morning consecrated to the enormous event, he arose nervously at six o'clock, dressed himself, adjusted an impeccable stock, and hurried forth through the streets of Baltimore to the hospital, to determine whether the darkness of the night had borne in new life upon its bosom. When he was approximately a hundred yards from the Maryland private hospital for ladies and gentlemen, he saw Dr. Keene, the family physician, descending the front steps, rubbing his hands together with a washing movement, as all doctors are required to do by the unwritten ethics of their profession. Mr. Roger Button, the president of Roger Button & Company, Wholesale Hardware, began to run toward Dr. Keene with much less dignity than was expected from a southern gentleman of that picturesque period. "'Dr. Keene!' he called. "'Oh, Dr. Keene!' The doctor heard him, faced around, and stood waiting, a curious expression settling on his harsh, medicinal face as Mr. Button drew near. "'What happened?' demanded Mr. Button, as he came up in a gasping rush. "'What was it? How is she? A boy? Who is it? What?' "'Talk sense,' said Dr. Keene sharply. He appeared somewhat irritated. "'Is the child born?' begged Mr. Button. Dr. Keene frowned. "'Why, yes, I suppose so, after a fashion.' Again he threw a curious glance at Mr. Button. "'Is my wife all right?' "'Yes.' "'Is it a boy or a girl?' "'Here now,' cried Dr. Keene, in a perfect passion of irritation. "'I'll ask you to go and see for yourself. Outrageous!' He snapped the last word out in almost one syllable. Then he turned away, muttering, "'Do you imagine a case like this will help my professional reputation? One more would ruin me, ruin anybody.' "'What's the matter?' demanded Mr. Button, appalled. "'Triplets?' "'No, not triplets,' answered the doctor cuttingly. "'What's more, you can go and see for yourself, and get another doctor. I brought you into the world, young man, and I've been physician to your family for forty years, but I'm through with you. I don't want to see you or any of your relatives ever again. Good-bye.' Then he turned sharply, and without another word climbed into his phaeton, which was waiting at the curbstone, and drove severely away. Mr. Button stood there upon the sidewalk, stupefied and trembling from head to foot. What horrible mishap had occurred? He had suddenly lost all desire to go into the Maryland private hospital for ladies and gentlemen. It was with the greatest difficulty that, a moment later, he forced himself to mount the steps and enter the front door. A nurse was sitting behind a desk in the opaque gloom of the hall. Swallowing his shame, Mr. Button approached her. "'Good morning,' she remarked, looking up at him pleasantly. "'Good morning. I, I am Mr. Button.' At this a look of utter terror spread itself over the girl's face. She rose to her feet and seemed about to fly from the hall, restraining herself only with the most apparent difficulty. "'I want to see my child,' said Mr. Button. The nurse gave a little scream. "'Oh, of course!' she cried hysterically. "'Upstairs! Right upstairs! Go up!' She pointed the direction, and Mr. Button, bathed in a cool perspiration, turned falteringly, and began to mount to the second floor. In the upper hall he addressed another nurse who approached him, basin in hand. "'I'm Mr. Button,' he managed to articulate. "'I want to see my—' "'Clank!' The basin clattered to the floor and rolled in the direction of the stairs. Clank! Clank! 
It began a methodical descent, as if sharing in the general terror which this gentleman provoked. "'I want to see my child!' Mr. Button almost shrieked. He was on the verge of collapse. Clank! The basin had reached the first floor. The nurse regained control of herself, and threw Mr. Button a look of hearty contempt. "'All right, Mr. Button,' she agreed in a hushed voice. "'Very well. But if you knew what state it's put us all in this morning, it's perfectly outrageous. The hospital will never have the ghost of a reputation after—' "'Hurry!' he cried hoarsely. "'I can't stand this!' "'Come this way, then, Mr. Button.' He dragged himself after her. At the end of a long hall they reached a room from which proceeded a variety of howls, indeed a room which, in later parlance, would have been known as the crying room. They entered. "'Well,' gasped Mr. Button, "'which is mine?' "'There,' said the nurse. Mr. Button's eyes followed her pointing finger, and this is what he saw. Wrapped in a voluminous white blanket, and partially crammed into one of the cribs, there sat an old man, apparently about seventy years of age. His sparse hair was almost white, and from his chin dripped a long, smoke-colored beard, which waved absurdly back and forth, fanned by the breeze coming in at the window. He looked up at Mr. Button with dim, faded eyes, in which lurked a puzzled question. "'Am I mad?' thundered Mr. Button, his terror resolving into rage. "'Is this some ghastly hospital joke?' "'It doesn't seem like a joke to us,' replied the nurse severely. "'And I don't know whether you're mad or not, but that is most certainly your child.' The cool perspiration redoubled on Mr. Button's forehead. He closed his eyes, and then, opening them, looked again. There was no mistake— he was gazing at a man of threescore and ten, a baby of threescore and ten, a baby whose feet hung over the sides of the crib in which it was reposing. The old man looked placidly from one to the other for a moment, and then suddenly spoke in a cracked and ancient voice. "'Are you my father?' he demanded. Mr. Button and the nurse started violently. "'Because if you are,' went on the old man querulously, I wish you'd get me out of this place, or at least get them to put a comfortable rocker in here. Where in God's name did you come from? Who are you? burst out Mr. Button frantically. I can't tell you exactly who I am, replied the querulous whine, because I've only been born a few hours, but my last name is certainly Button. You lie. You're an impostor. The old man turned wearily to the nurse. "'Nice way to welcome a new-born child,' he complained in a weak voice. "'Tell him he's wrong, why don't you?' "'You're wrong, Mr. Button,' said the nurse severely. "'This is your child, and you'll have to make the best of it. We're going to ask you to take him home with you as soon as possible, sometime today.' "'Home?' repeated Mr. Button incredulously. "'Yes, we can't have him here. We really can't, you know.' "'I'm right glad of it,' whined the old man. "'This is a fine place to keep a youngster of quiet tastes. "'With all this yelling and howling, I haven't been able to get a wink of sleep. "'I asked for something to eat.' "'Here his voice rose to a shrill note of protest. "'And they brought me a bottle of milk!' Mr. Button sank down upon a chair near his son, and concealed his face in his hands. "'My heavens!' he murmured, in an ecstasy of horror. "'What will people say? What must I do?' "'You'll have to take him home,' insisted the nurse. "'Immediately!' A grotesque picture formed himself with dreadful clarity before the eyes of the tortured man a picture of himself walking through the crowded streets of the city with this appalling apparition stalking by his side. "'I can't! I can't!' he moaned. People would stop to speak to him, and what was he going to say? He would have to introduce this, this septuagenarian. "'This is my son, born early this morning.' and then the old man would gather his blanket around him and they would plod on past the bustling stores the slave market for a dark instant mr button wished passionately that his son was black 
past the luxurious houses of the residential district, past the home for the aged. "'Come, pull yourself together,' commanded the nurse. "'See here,' the old man announced suddenly. "'If you think I'm going to walk home in this blanket, you're entirely mistaken.' "'Babies always have blankets.' With a malicious crackle, the old man held up a small white swaddling garment. Look, he quavered, this is what they had ready for me. Babies always wear those, said the nurse primly. Well, said the old man, this baby's not going to wear anything in about two minutes. This blanket itches. They might at least have given me a sheet. Keep it on, keep it on, said Mr. Button hurriedly. He turned to the nurse. "'What'll I do?' "'Go downtown and buy your son some clothes.' Mr. Button's son's voice followed him down into the hall. "'And a cane, father. I want to have a cane.' Mr. Button banged the outer door savagely. CHAPTER Two. "'Good morning,' Mr. Button said, nervously, to the clerk in the Chesapeake Dry Goods Company. I want to buy some clothes for my child. How old is your child, sir? About six hours, answered Mr. Button, without due consideration. Baby's supply department in the rear. Why, I don't think, I'm not sure that's what I want. It's, he's an unusually large-sized child. Exceptionally, uh, large. They have the largest child sizes. "'Where is the boys' department?' inquired Mr. Button, shifting his ground desperately. He felt that the clerk must surely scent his shameful secret. "'Right here.' "'Well,' he hesitated. The notion of dressing his son in men's clothes was repugnant to him. If, say, he could only find a very large boy suit, he might cut off that long and awful beard, dye the white hair brown, and thus manage to conceal the worst— and to retain something of his own self-respect, not to mention his position in Baltimore society. But a frantic inspection of the boys' department revealed no suits to fit the newborn button. He blamed the store, of course. In such cases, it is the thing to blame the store. "'How old did you say that boy of yours was?' demanded the clerk curiously. "'He's sixteen. "'Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you said six hours.' You'll find the youth department in the next aisle. Mr. Button turned miserably away. Then he stopped, brightened, and pointed his finger toward a dressed dummy in the window display. There, he exclaimed. I'll take that suit out there on the dummy. The clerk stared. Why, he protested, that's not a child's suit. At least it is, but it's for fancy dress. You could wear it yourself. Wrap it up insisted his customer nervously. That's what I want. The astonished clerk obeyed. Back at the hospital, Mr. Button entered the nursery and almost threw the package at his son. Here's your clothes, he snapped out. The old man untied the package and viewed the contents with a quizzical eye. They look sort of funny to me, he complained. I don't want to be made a monkey of... "'You've made a monkey of me,' retorted Mr. Button fiercely. "'Never you mind how funny you look. "'Put them on, or I'll, or I'll spank you.' "'He swallowed uneasily at the penultimate word, "'feeling nevertheless that it was the proper thing to say. "'All right, father,' this with a grotesque simulation of filial respect. "'You've lived longer, you know best, just as you say.' As before, the sound of the word father caused Mr. Button to start violently. And hurry. I'm hurrying, father. When his son was dressed, Mr. Button regarded him with depression. The costume consisted of dotted socks, pink pants, and a belted blouse with a wide white collar. Over the latter waved the long whitish beard, drooping almost to the waist. The effect was not good. Wait! Mr. Button seized a hospital shears, and with three quick snaps amputated a large section of the beard. But even with this improvement, the ensemble fell far short of perfection. 
The remaining brush of scraggly hair, the watery eyes, the ancient teeth, seemed oddly out of tone with the gaiety of the costume. Mr. Button, however, was obdurate. He held out his hand. "'Come along,' he said sternly. His son took the hand trustingly. "'What are you going to call me, Dad?' he quavered as they walked from the nursery. "'Just baby for a while, till you think of a better name?' Mr. Button grunted. "'I don't know,' he answered harshly. "'I think we'll call you Methuselah.' Chapter 3 Even after the new addition to the Button family had had his hair cut short and then dyed to a sparse, unnatural black, had had his face shaved so close that it glistened, and had been attired in a small boy clothes made to order by a flabbergasted tailor, it was impossible for Mr. Button to ignore the fact that his son was a poor excuse for a first family baby. Despite his aged stoop, Benjamin Button, for it was by this name they called him instead of by the appropriate but invidious Methuselah, was five feet eight inches tall. His clothes did not conceal this, nor did the clipping and dyeing of his eyebrows disguise the fact that the eyes underneath were faded and watery and tired. In fact, the baby nurse, who had been engaged in advance, left the house after one look, in a state of considerable indignation. But Mr. Button persisted in his unwavering purpose. Benjamin was a baby, and a baby he should remain. At first he declared that if Benjamin didn't like warm milk, he could go without food altogether. But he was finally prevailed upon to allow his son bread and butter, and even oatmeal by way of a compromise. One day he brought home a rattle, and, giving it to Benjamin, insisted in no uncertain terms that he should play with it, whereupon the old man took it with a weary expression, and could be heard jingling it obediently at intervals throughout the day. There can be no doubt, though, that the rattle bored him, and that he found other and more soothing amusements when he was left alone. For instance, Mr. Button discovered one day that during the preceding week he had smoked more cigars than ever before a phenomenon which was explained a few days later when, entering the nursery unexpectedly, he found the room full of faint blue haze, and Benjamin, with a guilty expression on his face, trying to conceal the butt of a dark Havana. This, of course, called for a severe spanking, but Mr. Button found that he could not bring himself to administer it. He merely warned his son that he would stunt his growth. Nevertheless, he persisted in his attitude. He brought home lead soldiers, he brought toy trains, he brought large pleasant animals made of cotton, and to perfect the illusion which he was creating, for himself at least, he passionately demanded of the clerk in the toy store whether the paint would come off the pink duck if the baby put it in his mouth. But despite all his father's efforts, Benjamin refused to be interested. He would steal down the back stairs and return to the nursery with a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica, over which he would pour through an afternoon, while his cotton cows and his Noah's Ark were left neglected on the floor. Against such a stubbornness, Mr. Button's efforts were of little avail. The sensation created in Baltimore was, at first, prodigious. What the mishap would have cost the Buttons and their kinsfolk socially cannot be determined, for the outbreak of the Civil War drew the city's attention to other things. A few people who were unfailingly polite racked their brains for compliments to give to the parents, and finally hit upon the ingenious device of declaring that the baby resembled his grandfather, a fact which, due to the standard state of decay common to all men of seventy, could not be denied. Mr. and Mrs. Roger Button were not pleased and Benjamin's grandfather was furiously insulted. Benjamin, once he left the hospital, took life as he found it. Several small boys were brought to see him, and he spent a stiff-jointed afternoon trying to work up an interest in tops and marbles. He even managed, quite accidentally, to break a kitchen window with a stone from a slingshot, a feat which secretly delighted his father. Thereafter, Benjamin contrived to break something every day, but he did these things only because they were expected of him, and because he was by nature obliging. When his grandfather's initial antagonism wore off, Benjamin and that gentleman took enormous pleasure in one another's company. They would sit for hours, these two so far apart in age and experience, and, like old cronies, discuss with tireless monotony the slow events of the day. Benjamin felt more at ease in his grandfather's presence than in his parents', 
they seemed always somewhat in awe of him, and, despite the dictatorial authority they exercised over him, frequently addressed him as Mr. He was as puzzled as anyone else at the apparently advanced age of his mind and body at birth. He read up on it in the medical journal, but found that no such case had been previously recorded. At his father's urging he made an honest attempt to play with other boys, and frequently he joined in the milder games. Football shook him up too much, and he feared that in case of a fracture his ancient bones would refuse to knit. When he was five he was sent to kindergarten, where he was initiated into the art of pasting green paper on orange paper, of weaving colored maps, and manufacturing eternal cardboard necklaces. He was inclined to drowse off to sleep in the middle of these tasks, a habit which both irritated and frightened his young teacher. To his relief she complained to his parents, and he was removed from the school. The Roger Buttons told their friends that they felt he was too young. By the time he was twelve years old his parents had grown used to him. Indeed, so strong is the force of custom that they no longer felt that he was different from any other child, except when some curious anomaly reminded them of the fact. But one day, a few weeks after his twelfth birthday, while looking in the mirror, Benjamin made, or thought he made, an astonishing discovery. Did his eyes deceive him, or had his hair turned in the dozen years of his life from white to iron gray under its concealing dye? Was the network of wrinkles on his face becoming less pronounced? Was his skin healthier and firmer, with even a touch of ruddy winter color? He could not tell. He knew that he no longer stooped, and that his physical condition had improved since the early days of his life. Can it be, he thought to himself, or rather, scarcely dared to think. He went to his father. I am grown, he announced determinedly. I want to put on long trousers. His father hesitated. Well, he said finally, I don't know. Fourteen is the age for putting on long trousers, and you are only twelve. But you'll have to admit, protested Benjamin, that I am big for my age. His father looked at him with illusory speculation. Oh, I'm not so sure of that, he said. I was as big as you when I was twelve. This was not true. It was all part of Roger Button's silent agreement with himself to believe in his son's normality. Finally, a compromise was reached. Benjamin was to continue to dye his hair. He was to make a better attempt to play with boys of his own age. He was not to wear his spectacles or carry a cane in the street. In return for these concessions, he was allowed his first suit of long trousers. Chapter 4 Of the life of Benjamin Button between his twelfth and twenty-first year, I intend to say little. Suffice to record that they were years of normal ungrowth. When Benjamin was eighteen, he was erect as a man of fifty. He had more hair, and it was of a dark gray. His step was firm, his voice had lost its cracked quaver, and descended to a healthy baritone. So his father sent him up to Connecticut to take examinations for entrance to Yale College. Benjamin passed his examination and became a member of the freshman class. On the third day following his matriculation, he received a notification from Mr. Hart, the college registrar, to call at his office and arrange his schedule. Benjamin, glancing in the mirror, decided that his hair needed a new application of its brown dye, but an anxious inspection of his bureau drawer disclosed that the dye bottle was not there. Then he remembered he had emptied it the day before and thrown it away. He was in a dilemma. He was due at the registrar's in five minutes. There seemed to be no help for it. He must go as he was. He did. "'Good morning,' said the registrar politely. "'You've come to inquire about your son.' "'Why, as a matter of fact, my name's Button,' began Benjamin, but Mr. Hart cut him off. "'I'm very glad to meet you, Mr. Button. I'm expecting your son here any minute.' "'That's me,' burst out Benjamin. "'I'm a freshman.' "'What? I'm a freshman.' "'Surely you're joking.' "'Not at all.' The registrar frowned and glanced at a card before him. "'Why, I have Mr. Benjamin Button's age down here as eighteen.' "'That's my age,' asserted Benjamin, flushing slightly. The registrar eyed him wearily. 
Now, surely, Mr. Button, you don't expect me to believe that. Benjamin smiled wearily. I am eighteen, he repeated. The registrar pointed sternly to the door. Get out, he said. Get out of college and get out of town. You are a dangerous lunatic. I am eighteen. Mr. Hart opened the door. The idea, he shouted, a man of your age trying to enter here as a freshman. Eighteen years old, are you? Well, I'll give you eighteen minutes to get out of town. Benjamin Button walked with dignity from the room, and half a dozen undergraduates, who were waiting in the hall, followed him curiously with their eyes. When he had gone a little way, he turned around, faced the infuriated registrar, who was still standing in the doorway, and repeated in a firm voice, I am eighteen years old. To a chorus of titters which went up from the group of undergraduates, Benjamin walked away. But he was not fated to escape so easily. On his melancholy walk to the railroad station, he found that he was being followed by a group, then by a swarm, and finally by a dense mass of undergraduates. The word had gone around that a lunatic had passed the entrance examinations for Yale and attempted to palm himself off as a youth of eighteen. A fever of excitement permeated the college. Men ran hatless out of classes. The football team abandoned its practice and joined the mob. Professors' wives, with bonnets awry and bustles out of position, ran shouting after the procession, from which proceeded a continual succession of remarks aimed at the tender sensibilities of Benjamin Button. He must be the wandering Jew. He ought to go to prep school at his age. Look at the infant prodigy. He thought this was the old men's home. Go up to Harvard. Benjamin increased his gait and soon he was running. He would show them he would go to Harvard, and then they would regret these ill-considered taunts. Safely on board the train for Baltimore, he put his head from the window. "'You'll regret this!' he shouted. "'Ha-ha!' the undergraduates laughed. "'Ha-ha-ha!' It was the biggest mistake that Yale College had ever made. End of Part 1 The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald, Part 2. Chapter 5. In 1880, Benjamin Button was twenty years old and he signalized his birthday by going to work for his father in Roger Button and Company Wholesale Hardware. It was in that same year that he began going out socially. That is, his father insisted on taking him to several fashionable dances. Roger Button was now fifty, and he and his son were more and more companionable. In fact, since Benjamin had ceased to dye his hair, which was still grayish, they appeared about the same age, and could have passed for brothers. One night in August they got into the Phaeton, attired in their full-dress suits, and drove out to a dance at the Shevlin's country house, situated just outside of Baltimore. It was a gorgeous evening. A full moon drenched the road to the lusterless color of platinum, and late-blooming harvest flowers breathed into the motionless air aromas that were like low, half-heard laughter. The open country, carpeted for rods around with bright wheat, was translucent as in the day. It was almost impossible not to be affected by the sheer beauty of the sky. Almost. "'There's a great future in the dry-goods business,' Roger Button was saying. He was not a spiritual man. His aesthetic sense was rudimentary. "'Old fellows like me can't learn new tricks,' he observed profoundly. "'It's you youngsters, with energy and vitality, that have the great future before you.' Far up the road the lights of the Shevlin's country house drifted into view, and presently there was a sighing sound that crept persistently toward them. It might have been the fine plaint of violins, or the rustle of the silver wheat under the moon. They pulled up behind a handsome brougham whose passengers were disembarking at the door. A lady got out, then an elderly gentleman, then another young lady, beautiful as sin. Benjamin started. 
an almost chemical change seemed to dissolve and recompose the very elements of his body. A rigor passed over him, blood rose into his cheeks, his forehead, and there was a steady thumping in his ears. It was first love. The girl was slender and frail, with hair that was ashen under the moon and honey-colored under the sputtering gas-lamps of the porch. Over her shoulders was thrown a Spanish mantilla of softest yellow, butterflied in black. Her feet were glittering buttons at the hem of her bustled dress. Roger Button leaned over to his son. That, he said, is young Hildegard Moncrief, the daughter of General Moncrief. Benjamin nodded coldly. Pretty little thing, he said indifferently. But when the negro boy had led the buggy away, he added, Dad, you might introduce me to her. They approached a group of which Miss Moncrief was the center. Reared in the old tradition, she courtesied low before Benjamin. Yes, he might have a dance. He thanked her and walked away, staggered away. The interval until the time for his turn should arrive dragged itself out interminably. He stood close to the wall, silent, inscrutable, watching with murderous eyes the young bloods of Baltimore as they eddied around Hildegard Moncrief, passionate admiration in their faces. How obnoxious they seemed to Benjamin! How intolerably rosy! Their curling brown whiskers aroused in him a feeling equivalent to indigestion. But when his own time came, and he drifted with her out upon the changing floor to the music of the latest waltz from Paris, his jealousies and anxieties melted from him like a mantle of snow. Blind with enchantment, he felt that life was just beginning. "'You and your brother got here just as we did, didn't you?' asked Hildegard, looking up at him with eyes that were like bright blue enamel. Benjamin hesitated. If she took him for his father's brother, would it be best to enlighten her? He remembered his experience at Yale, so he decided against it. It would be rude to contradict a lady. It would be criminal to mar this exquisite occasion with the grotesque story of his origin. Later, perhaps. So he nodded, smiled, listened, was happy. "'I like men of your age,' Hildegard told him. "'Young boys are so idiotic. They tell me how much champagne they drink at college and how much money they lose playing cards.' Men of your age know how to appreciate women. Benjamin felt himself on the verge of a proposal. With an effort, he choked back the impulse. You're just the romantic age, she continued. Fifty. Twenty-five is too worldly-wise. Thirty is apt to be pale from overwork. Forty is the age of long stories that take a whole cigar to tell. Sixty is, oh, sixty is too near seventy. But fifty is the mellow age. I love fifty. Fifty seemed to Benjamin a glorious age. He longed passionately to be fifty. I've always said, went on Hildegard, that I'd rather marry a man of fifty and be taken care of than marry a man of thirty and take care of him. For Benjamin, the rest of the evening was bathed in a honey-colored mist. Hildegard gave him two more dances, and they discovered that they were marvelously in accord on all the questions of the day. She was to go driving with him on the following Sunday, and then they would discuss all these questions further. Going home in the Phaeton just before the crack of dawn, when the first bees were humming and the fading moon glimmered in the cool dew, Benjamin knew vaguely that his father was discussing wholesale hardware. "'And what do you think should merit our biggest attention after hammers and nails?' the elder Button was saying. "'Love,' replied Benjamin absent-mindedly. "'Lugs!' exclaimed Roger Button. "'Why, I've just covered the question of lugs.' Benjamin regarded him with dazed eyes, just as the eastern sky was suddenly cracked with light, and an oriole yawned piercingly in the quickening trees. Chapter 6 When, six months later, the engagement of Miss Hildegard Moncrief to Mr. Benjamin Button was made known— I say, made known, for General Moncrief declared he would rather fall upon his sword than announce it. The excitement in Baltimore society reached a feverish pitch. The almost forgotten story of Benjamin's birth was remembered and sent out upon the winds of scandal in picaresque and incredible forms. It was said that Benjamin was really the father of Roger Button, that he was his brother who had been in prison for forty years, that he was John Wilkes Booth in disguise, 
and finally that he had two small conical horns sprouting from his head. The Sunday supplements of the New York papers played up the case with fascinating sketches which showed the head of Benjamin Button attached to a fish, to a snake, and finally to a body of solid brass. He became known, journalistically, as the Mystery Man of Maryland. But the true story, as is usually the case, had a very small circulation. However, everyone agreed with General Moncrief that it was criminal for a lovely girl who could have married any beau in Baltimore to throw herself into the arms of a man who was assuredly fifty. In vain, Mr. Roger Button published his son's birth certificate in large type in the Baltimore Blaze. No one believed it. You had only to look at Benjamin and see. On the part of the two people most concerned, there was no wavering. So many of the stories about her fiancé were false that Hildegard refused stubbornly to believe even the true one. In vain, General Moncrief pointed out to her the high mortality among men of fifty, or at least among men who looked fifty. In vain, he told her of the instability of the wholesale hardware business. Hildegard had chosen to marry for mellowness, and marry she did. CHAPTER Seven. In one particular, at least, the friends of Hildegard Moncrief were mistaken. The wholesale hardware business prospered amazingly. In the fifteen years between Benjamin Button's marriage in 1880 and his father's retirement in 1895, the family fortune was doubled, and this was due largely to the younger member of the firm. Needless to say, Baltimore eventually received the couple to its bosom. Even old General Moncrief became reconciled to his son-in-law when Benjamin gave him the money to bring out his History of the Civil War in twenty volumes, which had been refused by nine prominent publishers. In Benjamin himself, fifteen years had wrought many changes. It seemed to him that the blood flowed with new vigor through his veins. It began to be a pleasure to rise in the morning, to walk with an active step along the busy, sunny street, to work untiringly with his shipments of hammers and his cargoes of nails. It was in 1890 that he executed his famous business coup. He brought up the suggestion that all nails used in nailing up the boxes in which nails are shipped are the property of the shippee. A proposal which became a statute was approved by Chief Justice Fossile and saved Roger Button and Company wholesale hardware more than 600 nails every year. In addition, Benjamin discovered that he was becoming more and more attracted by the gay side of life. It was typical of his growing enthusiasm for pleasure that he was the first man in the city of Baltimore to own and run an automobile. Meeting him on the street, his contemporaries would stare enviously at the picture he made of health and vitality. "'He seems to grow younger every year,' they would remark." And if old Roger Button, now sixty-five years old, had failed at first to give a proper welcome to his son, he atoned at last by bestowing on him what amounted to adulation. And here we come to an unpleasant subject which it will be well to pass over as quickly as possible. There was only one thing that worried Benjamin Button. His wife had ceased to attract him. At that time Hildegard was a woman of thirty-five, with a son, Roscoe, fourteen years old. In the early days of their marriage, Benjamin had worshipped her. But as the years passed, her honey-colored hair became an unexciting brown. The blue enamel of her eyes assumed the aspect of cheap crockery. Moreover, and most of all, she had become too settled in her ways, too placid, too content, too anemic in her excitements, and too sober in her taste. As a bride, it had been she who had dragged Benjamin to dances and dinners. Now conditions were reversed. She went out socially with him, but without enthusiasm, devoured already by that eternal inertia which comes to live with each of us one day and stays with us to the end. Benjamin's discontent waxed stronger. At the outbreak of the Spanish-American War in 1898, his home had for him so little charm that he decided to join the army. With his business influence, he obtained a commission as captain, and proved so adaptable to the work that he was made a major, and finally a lieutenant colonel, just in time to participate in the celebrated charge up San Juan Hill. He was slightly wounded, and received a medal. Benjamin had become so attached to the activity and excitement of army life that he regretted to give it up, but his business required attention, so he resigned his commission and came home. 
He was met at the station by a brass band and escorted to his house. Chapter 8 Hildegard, waving a large silk flag, greeted him on the porch, and even as he kissed her he felt with a sinking of the heart that these three years had taken their toll. She was a woman of forty now, with a faint skirmish line of gray hairs in her head. The sight depressed him. Up in his room he saw his reflection in the familiar mirror. He went closer and examined his own face with anxiety, comparing it, after a moment, with a photograph of himself in uniform taken just before the war. "'Good Lord!' he said aloud. The process was continuing. There was no doubt of it. He looked now like a man of thirty. Instead of being delighted, he was uneasy. He was growing younger. He had hitherto hoped that once he reached a bodily age equivalent to his age in years, the grotesque phenomenon which had marked his birth would cease to function. He shuddered. His destiny seemed to him awful, incredible. When he came downstairs, Hildegard was waiting for him. She appeared annoyed, and he wondered if she had at last discovered that there was something amiss. It was with an effort to relieve the tension between them that he broached the matter at dinner in what he considered a delicate way. "'Well,' he remarked lightly, "'everybody says I look younger than ever.' Hildegard regarded him with scorn. She sniffed. "'Do you think it's anything to boast about?' "'I'm not boasting,' he asserted uncomfortably. She sniffed again. "'The idea,' she said, and, after a moment, I should think you'd have enough pride to stop it. How can I? he demanded. I'm not going to argue with you, she retorted. But there's a right way of doing things, and a wrong way. If you've made up your mind to be different from everybody else, I don't suppose I can stop you, but I really don't think it's very considerate. But, Hildegard, I can't help it. You can, too. You're simply stubborn. You think you don't want to be like anyone else. You have always been that way, and you always will be. But just think how it would be if everyone else looked at things as you do. What would the world be like? As this was an inane and unanswerable argument, Benjamin made no reply, and from that time on a chasm began to widen between them. He wondered what possible fascination she had ever exercised over him. To add to the breach, he found, as the new century gathered headway, that his thirst for gaiety grew stronger. Never a party of any kind in the city of Baltimore, but he was there, dancing with the prettiest of the young married women, chatting with the most popular of the debutantes, and finding their company charming, while his wife, a dowager of evil omen, sat among the chaperones, now in haughty disapproval, and now following him with solemn, puzzled, and reproachful eyes. Look, people would remark, what a pity, a young fellow that age tied to a woman of forty-five. He must be twenty years younger than his wife. They had forgotten, as people inevitably forget, that back in 1880 their mamas and papas had also remarked about this same ill-matched pair. Benjamin's growing unhappiness at home was compensated for by his many new interests. He took up golf and made a great success of it. He went in for dancing. In 1906 he was an expert at the Boston, and in 1908 he was considered proficient at the Maxis while in 1909 his castle walk was the envy of every young man in town. His social activities, of course, interfered to some extent with his business, but then he had worked hard at wholesale hardware for twenty-five years, and felt that he could soon hand it on to his son, Roscoe, who had recently graduated from Harvard. He and his son were, in fact, often mistaken for each other, this pleased Benjamin. He soon forgot the insidious fear which had come over him on his return from the Spanish-American War, and grew to take a naive pleasure in his appearance. There was only one fly in the delicious ointment. He hated to appear in public with his wife. Hildegard was almost fifty, and the sight of her made him feel absurd. Chapter 9 one September day in 1910, a few years after Roger Button and Company, Wholesale Hardware, had been handed over to young Roscoe Button, a man, apparently about twenty years old, entered himself as a freshman at Harvard University in Cambridge. He did not make the mistake of announcing that he would never see fifty again, nor did he mention the fact that his son had been graduated from the same institution ten years before. 
he was admitted and almost immediately attained a prominent position in the class partly because he seemed a little older than the other freshmen whose average age was about eighteen but his success was largely due to the fact that in the football game with Yale he played so brilliantly, with so much dash, and with such a cold, remorseless anger, that he scored seven touchdowns and fourteen field goals for Harvard, and caused one entire eleven of Yale men to be carried singly from the field, unconscious. He was the most celebrated man in college. Strange to say, in his third or junior year, he was scarcely able to make the team. The coaches said that he had lost weight, and it seemed to the more observant among them that he was not quite as tall as before. He made no touchdowns. Indeed, he was retained on the team chiefly in hope that his enormous reputation would bring terror and disorganization to the Yale team. In his senior year, he did not make the team at all. He had grown so slight and frail that one day he was taken by some sophomores for a freshman, an incident which humiliated him terribly. He became known as something of a prodigy, a senior who was surely no more than sixteen, and he was often shocked at the worldliness of some of his classmates. His studies seemed harder to him. He felt that they were too advanced. He had heard his classmates speak of St. Midas's, the famous preparatory school, at which so many of them had prepared for college, and he determined after his graduation to enter himself at St. Midas's, where the sheltered life among boys his own size would be more congenial to him. Upon his graduation in 1914, he went home to Baltimore with his Harvard diploma in his pocket. Hildegard was now residing in Italy, so Benjamin went to live with his son, Roscoe. But though he was welcomed in a general way, there was obviously no heartiness in Roscoe's feeling toward him. There was even perceptible a tendency on his son's part to think that Benjamin, as he moped about the house in adolescent mooniness, was somewhat in the way. Roscoe was married now, and prominent in Baltimore life, and he wanted no scandal to creep out in connection with his family. Benjamin, no longer persona grata with the debutantes and younger college set, found himself left much alone, except for the companionship of three or four fifteen-year-old boys in the neighborhood. His idea of going to St. Midas's school recurred to him. Say, he said to Roscoe one day, I've told you over and over that I want to go to prep school. "'Well, go, then,' replied Roscoe shortly. The matter was distasteful to him, and he wished to avoid a discussion. "'I can't go alone,' said Benjamin helplessly. "'You'll have to enter me and take me up there.' "'I haven't got time,' declared Roscoe abruptly. His eyes narrowed, and he looked uneasily at his father. "'As a matter of fact,' he added, "'you'd better not go on with this business much longer. "'You better pull up short. "'You better... you better... He paused, and his face crimsoned as he sought for words. "'You better turn right around and start back the other way. This has gone too far to be a joke. It isn't funny any longer. You, you behave yourself.' Benjamin looked at him on the verge of tears. "'And another thing,' continued Roscoe. "'When visitors are in the house, I want you to call me Uncle. Not Roscoe, but Uncle. Do you understand? It looks absurd for a boy of fifteen to call me by my first name.' Perhaps you'd better call me uncle all the time, so you'll get used to it. With a harsh look at his father, Roscoe turned away. Chapter 10 At the termination of this interview, Benjamin wandered dismally upstairs and stared at himself in the mirror. He had not shaved for three months, but he could find nothing on his face but a faint white down with which it seemed unnecessary to meddle. When he had first come home from Harvard, Roscoe had approached him with the proposition that he should wear eyeglasses and imitation whiskers glued to his cheeks, and it had seemed for a moment that the farce of his early years was to be repeated. But whiskers had itched and made him ashamed. He wept, and Roscoe had reluctantly relented. Benjamin opened a book of boys' stories, The Boy Scouts in Bimini Bay, and began to read but he found himself thinking persistently about the war. America had joined the Allied cause during the preceding month, and Benjamin wanted to enlist. But, alas, sixteen was the minimum age, and he did not look that old. His true age, which was fifty-seven, would have disqualified him anyway. There was a knock at his door, and the butler appeared with a letter bearing a large official legend in the corner and addressed to Mr. Benjamin Button. Benjamin tore it open eagerly and read the enclosure with delight. 
It informed him that many reserve officers who had served in the Spanish-American War were being called back into service with a higher rank, and it enclosed his commission as Brigadier General in the United States Army, with orders to report immediately. Benjamin jumped to his feet, fairly quivering with enthusiasm. This was what he had wanted— he seized his cap, and ten minutes later he had entered a large tailoring establishment on Charles Street, and asked in his uncertain treble to be measured for a uniform. "'Want to play soldier, Sonny?' demanded a clerk, casually. Benjamin flushed. "'Say, never mind what I want,' he retorted angrily. "'My name's Button, and I live on Mount Vernon Place, so you know I'm good for it.' "'Well,' admitted the clerk, hesitantly, if you are not, I guess your daddy is, all right. Benjamin was measured, and a week later his uniform was completed. He had difficulty in obtaining the proper general's insignia, because the dealer kept insisting to Benjamin that a nice YWCA badge would look just as well and be much more fun to play with. Saying nothing to Roscoe, he left the house one night and proceeded by train to Camp Mosby in South Carolina, where he was to command an infantry brigade. On a sultry April day he approached the entrance to the camp, paid off the taxicab which had brought him from the station, and turned to the sentry on guard. "'Get someone to handle my luggage,' he said briskly. The sentry eyed him reproachfully. "'Say,' he remarked, "'where are you going with the general's dud, Sonny?' Benjamin, veteran of the Spanish-American War, whirled upon him with fire in his eye, but with, alas, a changing treble voice. "'Come to attention,' he tried to thunder. He paused for breath. Then suddenly he saw the sentry snap his heels together and bring his rifle to the present. Benjamin concealed a smile of gratification, but when he glanced around his smile faded. It was not he who had inspired obedience, but an imposing artillery colonel who was approaching on horseback. "'Colonel!' called Benjamin shrilly. The colonel came up, drew rein, and looked coolly down at him with a twinkle in his eyes. "'Whose little boy are you?' he demanded, kindly. "'I'll soon darn well show you whose little boy I am,' retorted Benjamin, in a ferocious voice. "'Get down off that horse!' The colonel roared with laughter. "'You want him, head general?' "'Here,' cried Benjamin, desperately. "'Read this,' and he thrust his commission toward the colonel. The colonel read it, his eyes popping from their sockets. "'Where'd you get this?' he demanded, slipping the document into his own pocket. "'I got it from the government, as you'll soon find out.' "'You come along with me,' said the colonel, with a peculiar look. "'We'll go up to headquarters and talk this over. Come along.' The colonel turned and began walking his horse in the direction of headquarters. There was nothing for Benjamin to do but follow with as much dignity as possible." meanwhile promising himself a stern revenge. But this revenge did not materialize. Two days later, however, his son Roscoe materialized from Baltimore, hot and cross from a hasty trip, and escorted the weeping general, sans uniform, back to his home. Chapter 11 In 1920, Roscoe Button's first child was born. During the attendant festivities, however, no one thought it the thing to mention that the little grubby boy, apparently about ten years of age, who played around the house with lead soldiers and a miniature circus, was the new baby's own grandfather. No one disliked the little boy whose fresh, cheerful face was crossed with just a hint of sadness, but to Roscoe Button his presence was a source of torment. In the idiom of his generation, Roscoe did not consider the matter efficient, it seemed to him that his father, in refusing to look sixty, had not behaved like a red-blooded he-man, this was Roscoe's favorite expression, but in a curious and perverse manner. Indeed, to think about the matter for as much as half an hour drove him to the edge of insanity. Roscoe believed that live wires should keep young, but carrying it out on such a scale was, was, was inefficient, and there Roscoe rested. Five years later, Roscoe's little boy had grown old enough to play childish games with little Benjamin under the supervision of the same nurse. Roscoe took them both to kindergarten on the same day, and Benjamin found that playing with little strips of colored paper, making mats and chains and curious and beautiful designs, was the most fascinating game in the world. 
Once he was bad and had to stand in the corner. Then he cried. But for the most part there were gay hours in the cheerful room, with the sunlight coming in the windows and Miss Bailey's kind hand resting for a moment now and then in his tousled hair. Roscoe's son moved up into the first grade after a year, but Benjamin stayed on in the kindergarten. He was very happy. Sometimes when other tots talked about what they would do when they grew up, a shadow would cross his little face, as if in a dim, childish way he realized that those were things in which he was never to share. The days flowed on in monotonous content. He went back a third year to the kindergarten, but he was too little now to understand what the bright shining strips of paper were for. He cried because the other boys were bigger than he, and he was afraid of them. The teacher talked to him, but though he tried to understand, he could not understand at all. He was taken from the kindergarten. His nurse, Nana, in her starched gingham dress, became the center of his tiny world. On bright days they walked in the park. Nana would point at a great gray monster and say, Elephant, and Benjamin would say it after her. And when he was being undressed for bed that night, he would say it over and over aloud to her, Elephant, Elephant, Elephant. Sometimes Nana let him jump on the bed, which was fun, because if you sat down exactly right, it would bounce you up on your feet again, and if you said, ah, for a long time while you jumped, you got a very pleasing broken vocal effect. He loved to take a big cane from the hat rack and go around hitting chairs and tables with it and saying, fight, fight, fight. When there were people there, the old ladies would cluck at him, which interested him, and the young ladies would try to kiss him which he submitted to with mild boredom. And when the long day was done at five o'clock, he would go upstairs with Nana and be fed oatmeal and nice, soft, mushy foods with a spoon. There were no troublesome memories in his childish sleep. No token came to him of his brave days at college, of the glittering years when he flustered the hearts of many girls. There were only the white, safe walls of his crib, and Nana, and a man who came to see him sometimes and a great big orange ball that Nana pointed at just before his twilight bed hour and called Sun. When the sun went, his eyes were sleepy. There were no dreams, no dreams to haunt him. The past, the wild charge at the head of his men up San Juan Hill, the first years of his marriage when he worked late into the summer dusk down in the busy city for young Hildegard whom he loved, the days before that, when he sat smoking far into the night in the gloomy old button house on Monroe Street with his grandfather, all these had faded like unsubstantial dreams from his mind as though they had never been. He did not remember. He did not remember clearly whether the milk was warm or cool at his last feeding, or how the days passed. There was only his crib and Nana's familiar presence. And then he remembered nothing. When he was hungry, he cried. That was all. Through the noons and nights he breathed, and over him there were soft mumblings and murmurings that he scarcely heard, and faintly differentiated smells, and light and darkness. Then it was all dark, and his white crib and the dim faces that moved above him, and the warm, sweet aroma of the milk faded out altogether from his mind. End of The Curious Case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald Part 1 of The Lees of Happiness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden the Lees of Happiness by F. Scott Fitzgerald, Part One. Introduction Of this story I can say that it came to me in an irresistible form, crying to be written. It will be accused, perhaps, of being a mere piece of sentimentality, but as I saw it, it was a great deal more. If, therefore, it lacks the ring of sincerity, or even of tragedy, the fault rests not with the theme, but with my handling of it. It appeared in the Chicago Tribune, and later obtained, I believe, the quadruple gold laurel leaf, or some such encomium, from one of the anthologists, who at present swarm among us. The gentleman I refer to runs, as a rule, to stark melodramas with a volcano, or the ghost of John Paul Jones in the role of Nemesis, 
melodramas carefully disguised by early paragraphs in Jamesian manner which hint dark and subtle complexities to follow, on this order. The case of Shaw McPhee, curiously enough, had no bearing on the almost incredible attitude of Martin Sulo. This is parenthetical, and, to at least three observers, whose names for the present I must conceal, it seems improbable, etc., 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 until the poor rat of fiction is at least forced out into the open, and the melodrama begins. End of the introduction. The Lees of Happiness if you should look through the files of old magazines for the first years of the present century, you would find, sandwiched in between the stories of Richard Harding Davis and Frank Norris and others long since dead, the work of one Geoffrey Curtin, a novel or two, and perhaps three or four dozen short stories. You could, if you were interested, follow them along until, say, 1908, when they suddenly disappeared. When you had read them all, you would have been quite sure that here were no masterpieces. Here were passably amusing stories, a bit out of date now, but doubtless the sort that would then have whiled away a dreary half-hour in a dental office. The man who did them was of good intelligence, talented, glib, probably young. In the samples of his work you found, there would have been nothing to stir you to more than a faint interest in the whims of life, no deep interior laughs, no sense of futility or hint of tragedy. After reading them, you would yawn and put the number back in the files, and perhaps, if you were in some library reading room, you would decide that by way of variety you would look at a newspaper of the period and see whether the Japs had taken Port Arthur. But if by any chance the newspaper you had chosen was the right one and had crackled open at the theatrical page, your eyes would have been arrested and held, and for at least a minute you would have forgotten Port Arthur as quickly as you forgot Chateau Thierry. For you would, by this fortunate chance, be looking at the portrait of an exquisite woman. Those were the days of Floridora and of sextets, of pinched-in waists and blown-out sleeves, of almost bustles and absolute ballet skirts. But here, without doubt, disguised as she might be by the unaccustomed stiffness and old fashion of her costume, was a butterfly of butterflies. Here was the gaiety of the period, the soft wine of eyes, the songs that flurried hearts, the toasts and the bouquets, the dances and the dinners. Here was a Venus of the handsome cab, the Gibson girl in her glorious prime. Here was... Here was, you find by looking at the name beneath, one Roxanne Milbank, who had been chorus girl and understudy in The Daisy Chain, but who, by reason of an excellent performance when the star was indisposed, had gained a leading part. You would look again, and wonder, why you had never heard of her? Why did her name not linger in popular songs and vaudeville jokes and cigar bands, and the memory of that gay old uncle of yours, along with Lillian Russell and Stella Mayhew and Anna Held? Roxanne Milbank, whither had she gone? What dark trapdoor had opened suddenly and swallowed her up? Her name was certainly not in last Sunday's supplement on that list of actresses married to English noblemen. No doubt she was dead, poor beautiful young lady, and quite forgotten. I am hoping too much. I am having you stumble on Geoffrey Curtin's stories in Roxanne Milbank's picture. It would be incredible that you should find a newspaper item six months later, a single item two inches by four, which informed the public of the marriage, very quietly, of Miss Roxanne Milbank, who had been on tour with The Daisy Chain, to Mr. Geoffrey Curtin, the popular author. Mrs. Curtin, it added dispassionately, will retire from the stage. It was a marriage of love. He was sufficiently spoiled to be charming. She was ingenuous enough to be irresistible. Like two floating logs, they met in a head-on rush, caught and sped along together. Yet, had Geoffrey Curtin kept at scrivening for two score years, he could not have put a quirk into one of his stories weirder than the quirk that came into his own life. Had Roxanne Milbank played three dozen parts and filled five thousand houses, she could never have had a role with more happiness and more despair than were in the fate prepared for Roxanne Curtin. For a year they lived in hotels, traveled to California, 
to Alaska, to Florida, to Mexico, loved and quarreled gently, and gloried in the golden triflings of his wit with her beauty. They were young and gravely passionate. They demanded everything, and then yielded everything again in ecstasies of unselfishness and pride. She loved the swift tones of his voice and his frantic, unfounded jealousy. He loved her dark radiance, the white irises of her eyes, the warm, lustrous enthusiasm of her smile. "'Don't you like her?' he would demand, rather excitedly and shyly. "'Isn't she wonderful? Did you ever see?' "'Yes,' they would answer, grinning. "'She's a wonder. You're lucky.' The year passed. They tired of hotels. They bought an old house in twenty acres near the town of Marlowe, half an hour from Chicago, bought a little car, and moved out riotously with a pioneering hallucination that would have confounded Balboa. "'Your room will be here,' they cried in turn, and then, "'And my room here, and the nursery here when we have children, and we'll build a sleeping porch, oh, next year.' They moved out in April. In July, Geoffrey's closest friend, Harry Cromwell, came to spend a week. They met him at the end of the long lawn, and hurried him proudly to the house. Harry was married also. His wife had had a baby some six months before, and was still recuperating at her mother's in New York. Roxanne had gathered from Geoffrey that Harry's wife was not as attractive as Harry. Geoffrey had met her once, and considered her shallow. But Harry had been married nearly two years, and was apparently happy, so Geoffrey guessed that she was probably all right. "'I'm making biscuits,' chattered Roxanne gravely. "'Can your wife make biscuits? The cook is showing me how. I think every woman should know how to make biscuits. It sounds so utterly disarming. A woman who can make biscuits can surely do no—' "'You'll have to come out here and live,' said Geoffrey. "'Get a place out in the country like us, for you and Kitty.' "'You don't know Kitty. She hates the country. She's got to have her theaters and vaudevilles.' "'Bring her out,' repeated Geoffrey. "'We'll have a colony. There's an awfully nice crowd here already. Bring her out.' They were at the porch steps now, and Roxanne made a brisk gesture toward a dilapidated structure on the right. "'The garage,' she announced. "'It will also be Geoffrey's writing room within the month. Meanwhile, dinner is at seven. Meanwhile, to that, I will mix a cocktail.' The two men ascended to the second floor. That is, they ascended halfway, for at the first landing Geoffrey dropped his guest's suitcase, and in a cross between a query and a cry exclaimed, "'For God's sake, Harry, how do you like her?' "'We will go upstairs,' answered his guest, "'and we will shut the door.' Half an hour later, as they were sitting together in the library, Roxanne reissued from the kitchen, bearing before her a pan of biscuits. Geoffrey and Harry rose. "'They're beautiful, dear,' said the husband, intensely. "'Exquisite,' murmured Harry. Roxanne beamed. "'Taste one. I couldn't bear to touch them before you'd seen them all, and I can't bear to take them back until I find what they taste like.' "'Like manna, darling.' Simultaneously the two men raised the biscuits to their lips, nibbled tentatively. Simultaneously they tried to change the subject.' But Roxanne, undeceived, set down the pan and seized a biscuit. After a second, her comment rang out with lugubrious finality. Absolutely bum! Really? Why, I didn't notice. Roxanne roared. Oh, I'm useless, she cried, laughing. Turn me out, Geoffrey. I'm a parasite. I'm no good. Geoffrey put his arm around her. "'Darling, I'll eat your biscuits.' "'They're beautiful, anyway,' insisted Roxanne. "'They're... they're decorative,' suggested Harry. Geoffrey took him up wildly. "'That's the word. They're decorative. They're masterpieces. We'll use them.' He rushed to the kitchen and returned with a hammer and a handful of nails. "'We'll use them, by golly, Roxanne. We'll make a freeze out of them.' "'Don't!' wailed Roxanne. Our beautiful house! Never mind. We're going to have the library repapered in October. 
Don't you remember? Well. Bang! The first biscuit was impaled to the wall, where it quivered for a moment, like a live thing. Bang! When Roxanne returned with a second round of cocktails, the biscuits were in a perpendicular row, twelve of them, like a collection of primitive spearheads. Roxanne, exclaimed Geoffrey, you're an artist. Cook? Nonsense. You shall illustrate my books. During dinner the twilight faltered into dusk, and later it was a starry dark outside, filled and permeated with the frail gorgeousness of Roxanne's white dress and her tremulous low laugh. Such a little girl she is, thought Harry, not as old as Kitty. He compared the two. Kitty, nervous without being sensitive, temperamental without temperament, a woman who seemed to flit and never light, and Roxanne, who was as young as spring night and summed up in her own adolescent laughter. A good match for Geoffrey, he thought again. Two very young people, the sort who'll stay very young until they suddenly find themselves old. Harry thought these things between his constant thoughts about Kitty. He was depressed about Kitty. It seemed to him that she was well enough to come back to Chicago and bring his little son. He was thinking vaguely of Kitty when he said good night to his friend's wife and his friend at the foot of the stairs. "'You're our first real house-guest,' called Roxanne after him. "'Aren't you thrilled and proud?' When he was out of sight around the stair-corner, she turned to Geoffrey, who was standing beside her, resting his hand on the end of the banister. "'Are you tired, my dearest?' Geoffrey rubbed the center of his forehead with his fingers. "'A little. How did you know?' "'Oh, how could I help knowing about you?' "'It's a headache,' he said moodily. "'Splitting. I'll take some aspirin.' She reached over and snapped out the light, and with his arm tied about her waist, they walked up the stairs together. CHAPTER Two. Harry's week passed. They drove about the dreaming lanes, or idled in cheerful inanity upon lake or lawn. In the evening, Roxanne, sitting inside, played to them, while the ashes whitened on the glowing ends of their cigars. Then came a telegram from Kitty, saying that she wanted Harry to come east and get her, so Roxanne and Geoffrey were left alone in that privacy of which they never seemed to tire. Alone thrilled them again. They wandered about the house, each feeling intimately the presence of the other. They sat on the same side of the table like honeymooners. They were intensely absorbed, intensely happy. The town of Marlowe, though a comparatively old settlement, had only recently acquired a society. Five or six years before, alarmed at the smoky swelling of Chicago, two or three young married couples, bungalow people, had moved out. Their friends had followed. The Jeffrey Curtains found an already formed set prepared to welcome them. A country club, ballroom, and golf links yawned for them, and there were bridge parties and poker parties, and parties where they drank beer, and parties where they drank nothing at all. It was at a poker party that they found themselves a week after Harry's departure. There were two tables, and a good proportion of the young wives were smoking and shouting their bets, and being very daringly mannish for those days. Roxanne had left the game early and taken to perambulation. She wandered into the pantry and found herself some grape juice. Beer gave her a headache. And then passed from table to table, looking over shoulders at the hands, keeping an eye on Geoffrey and being pleasantly unexcited and content. Geoffrey, with intense concentration, was raising a pile of chips of all colors, and Roxanne knew by the deepened wrinkle between his eyes that he was interested. She liked to see him interested in small things. She crossed over quietly and sat down on the arm of his chair. She sat there five minutes, listening to the sharp, intermittent comments of the men and the chatter of the women, which rose from the table like soft smoke, and yet scarcely hearing either. Then, quite innocently, she reached out her hand, intending to place it on Geoffrey's shoulder. As it touched him, he started of a sudden, gave a short grunt, and sweeping back his arm furiously, caught her a glancing blow on her elbow. There was a general gasp. Roxanne regained her balance, gave a little cry, and rose quickly to her feet. It had been the greatest shock of her life. 
This, from Geoffrey, the heart of kindness, of consideration, this instinctively brutal gesture. The gasp became a silence. A dozen eyes were turned on Geoffrey, who looked up as though seeing Roxanne for the first time. An expression of bewilderment settled on his face. Why, Roxanne, he said haltingly. Into a dozen minds entered a quick suspicion, a rumor of scandal. Could it be that behind the scenes with this couple, apparently so in love, lurked some curious antipathy? Why else this streak of fire across such a cloudless heaven? Geoffrey! Roxanne's voice was pleading. Startled and horrified, she yet knew that it was a mistake. Not once did it occur to her to blame him or to resent it. Her word was a trembling supplication. "'Tell me, Geoffrey,' it said. "'Tell Roxanne, your own Roxanne.' "'Why, Roxanne,' began Geoffrey again. The bewildered look changed to pain. He was clearly as startled as she. "'I didn't intend that,' he went on. "'You startled me. You—' I felt as if someone were attacking me. I, how, why, how idiotic. Geoffrey. Again the word was a prayer, incense offered up to a high God through this new and unfathomable darkness. They were both on their feet, they were saying goodbye, faltering, apologizing, explaining. There was no attempt to pass it off easily. That way lay sacrilege. Geoffrey had not been feeling well, they said. He had become nervous. Back of both their minds was the unexplained horror of that blow, the marvel that there had been, for an instant, something between them, his anger and her fear, and now to both a sorrow, momentary, no doubt, but to be bridged at once, at once, while there was yet time. Was that swift water lashing under their feet, the fierce glint of some uncharted chasm? Out in their car, under the harvest moon, he talked brokenly. It was just incomprehensible to him, he said. He had been thinking of the poker game, absorbed, and the touch on his shoulder had seemed like an attack. An attack! He clung to that word, flung it up as a shield. He had hated what touched him. With the impact of his hand, it had gone, that nervousness. That was all he knew. Both their eyes filled with tears, and they whispered love there under the broad night as the serene streets of Marlowe sped by. Later, when they went to bed, they were quite calm. Geoffrey was to take a week off all work, was simply to loll and sleep and go on long walks until this nervousness left him. When they had decided this, safety settled down upon Roxanne. The pillows underhead became soft and friendly. The bed on which they lay seemed wide and white and sturdy beneath the radiance that streamed in at the window. Five days later, in the first cool of late afternoon, Geoffrey picked up an oak chair and sent it crashing through his own front window. Then he lay down on the couch like a child, weeping piteously and begging to die. A blood clot the size of a marble had broken in his brain. Chapter 3 there is a sort of waking nightmare that sets in sometimes when one has missed a sleep or two, a feeling that comes with extreme fatigue and a new sun, that the quality of the life around has changed. It is a fully articulate conviction that somehow the existence one is then leading is a branch shoot of life, and is related to life only as a moving picture or a mirror, that the people and streets and houses are only projections from a very dim and chaotic past. It was in such a state that Roxanne found herself during the first months of Geoffrey's illness. She slept only when she was utterly exhausted. She awoke under a cloud. The long, sober voice consultations, the faint aura of medicine in the halls, the sudden tiptoeing in a house that had echoed to many cheerful footsteps, and, most of all, Geoffrey's white face amid the pillows of the bed they had shared. These things subdued her and made her indelibly older. The doctors held out hope, but that was all. A long rest, they said, and quiet. So responsibility came to Roxanne. It was she who paid the bills, pored over his bank book, corresponded with his publishers. 
She was in the kitchen constantly. She learned from the nurse how to prepare his meals, and after the first month took complete charge of the sick room. She had had to let the nurse go for reasons of economy. One of the two colored girls left at the same time. Roxanne was realizing that they had been living from short story to short story. The most frequent visitor was Harry Cromwell. He had been shocked and depressed by the news, and though his wife was now living with him in Chicago, he found time to come out several times a month. Roxanne found his sympathy welcome. There was some quality of suffering in the man, some inherent pitifulness that made her comfortable when he was near. Roxanne's nature had suddenly deepened. She felt sometimes that with Geoffrey she was losing her children also, those children that now most of all she needed and should have had. It was six months after Geoffrey's collapse, and when the nightmare had faded, leaving not the old world, but a new one, grayer and colder, that she went to see Harry's wife. Finding herself in Chicago with an extra hour before train time, she decided, out of courtesy, to call. As she stepped inside the door, she had an immediate impression that the apartment was very like some place she had seen before, and almost instantly she remembered a round-the-corner bakery of her childhood, a bakery full of rows and rows of pink frosted cakes, a stuffy pink, pink as a food, pink triumphant, vulgar, and odious. And this apartment was like that. It was pink. It smelled pink. Mrs. Cromwell, attired in a wrapper of pink and black, opened the door. Her hair was yellow, heightened, Roxanne imagined, by a dash of peroxide in the rinsing water every week. Her eyes were a thin waxen blue. She was pretty and too consciously graceful. Her cordiality was strident and intimate. Hostility melted so quickly to hospitality that it seemed they were both merely in the face and voice never touching nor touched by the deep core of egotism beneath. But to Roxanne these things were secondary. Her eyes were caught and held in uncanny fascination by the wrapper. It was vilely unclean. From its lowest hem up four inches it was sheerly dirty with the blue dust of the floor. For the next three inches it was gray. Then it shaded off into its natural color, which was pink. It was dirty at the sleeves, too, and at the collar, and when the woman turned to lead the way into the parlor, Roxanne was sure that her neck was dirty. A one-sided rattle of conversation began. Mrs. Cromwell became explicit about her likes and dislikes, her head, her stomach, her teeth, her apartment, avoiding with a sort of insolent meticulousness any inclusion of Roxanne with life as if presuming that Roxanne, having been dealt a blow, wished life to be carefully skirted. Roxanne smiled. That kimono! That neck! After five minutes a little boy toddled into the parlor, a dirty little boy clad in dirty pink rompers. His face was smudgy. Roxanne wanted to take him into her lap and wipe his nose. Other parts in the vicinity of his head needed attention. His tiny shoes were kicked out at the toes. Unspeakable. "'What a darling little boy!' exclaimed Roxanne, smiling radiantly. "'Come here to me.' Mrs. Cromwell looked coldly at her son. "'He will get dirty. Look at that face.' She held her head on one side and regarded it critically. "'Isn't he a darling?' repeated Roxanne. Look at his rompers, frowned Mrs. Cromwell. He needs a change, don't you, George? George stared at her curiously. To his mind, the word rompers connotated a garment extraneously smeared, as this one. I tried to make him look respectable this morning, complained Mrs. Cromwell, as one whose patience had been sorely tried. And I found he didn't have any more rompers. So rather than have him go round without any, I put him back in those. And his face... How many pairs has he? Roxanne's voice was pleasantly curious. How many feather fans have you? she might have asked. Oh, Mrs. Cromwell considered, wrinkling her pretty brow. Five, I think. Plenty, I know. You can get them for fifty cents a pair. 
Mrs. Cromwell's eyes showed surprise, and the faintest superiority. The price of rompers. Can you really? I had no idea. He ought to have plenty, but I haven't had a minute all week to send the laundry out. Then, dismissing the subject as irrelevant, I must show you some things. They rose, and Roxanne followed her past an open bathroom door, whose garment-littered floor showed, indeed, that the laundry hadn't been sent out for some time, into another room that was, so to speak, the quintessence of pinkness. This was Mrs. Cromwell's room. Here the hostess opened a closet door and displayed before Roxanne's eyes an amazing collection of lingerie. There were dozens of filmy marvels of lace and silk all clean, unruffled, seemingly not yet touched. On hangers beside them were three new evening dresses. "'I have some beautiful things,' said Mrs. Cromwell, "'but not much of a chance to wear them. Harry doesn't care about going out.' Spite crept into her voice. "'He's perfectly content to let me play nursemaid and housekeeper all day, and loving wife in the evening.' Roxanne smiled again. You've got some beautiful clothes here. Yes, I have. Let me show you. Beautiful, repeated Roxanne, interrupting. But I'll have to run if I'm going to catch my train. She felt that her hands were trembling. She wanted to put them on this woman and shake her, shake her. She wanted her locked up somewhere and set to scrubbing floors. Beautiful, she repeated. And I just came in for a moment. Well, I'm sorry Harry isn't here. They moved toward the door. And, oh, said Roxanne with an effort, yet her voice was still gentle and her lips were smiling. I think it's Argyle's where you can get those rompers. Goodbye. It was not until she had reached the station and bought her ticket to Marlow that Roxanne realized that it was the first five minutes in six months that her mind had been off Geoffrey. End of part one. Part two of The Lees of Happiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Lees of Happiness by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part two. Chapter four. A week later, Harry appeared at Marlow, arrived unexpectedly at five o'clock, and, coming up the walk, sank into a porch chair in a state of exhaustion. Roxanne herself had had a busy day and was worn out. The doctors were coming at five-thirty, bringing a celebrated nerve specialist from New York. She was excited and thoroughly depressed, but Harry's eyes made her sit down beside him. "'What's the matter?' "'Nothing, Roxanne,' he denied. "'I came to see how Jeff was doing. "'Don't you bother about me.' "'Harry,' insisted Roxanne, "'there's something the matter.' "'Nothing,' he repeated. "'How's Jeff?' "'Anxiety darkened her face. "'He's a little worse, Harry. "'Dr. Jewett has come on from New York. "'They thought he could tell me something definite.' He's going to try and find whether this paralysis has anything to do with the original blood clot. Harry rose. Oh, I'm sorry, he said jerkily. I didn't know you expected a consultation. I wouldn't have come. I thought I'd just rock on your porch for an hour. Sit down, she commanded. Harry hesitated. Sit down, Harry, dear boy. Her kindness flooded out now enveloped him. I know there's something the matter. You're white as a sheet. I'm going to get you a cool bottle of beer. All at once he collapsed into his chair and covered his face with his hands. I can't make her happy, he said slowly. I've tried and I've tried. This morning we had some words about breakfast. I'd been getting my breakfast downtown. And... Well, just after I went to the office, she left the house, went east to her mother's with George and a suitcase full of lace underwear. Harry! And I don't know. There was a crunch on the gravel, a car turning into the drive. Roxanne uttered a little cry. 
It's Dr. Jewett. Oh, I'll... You'll wait, won't you? She interrupted abstractedly. He saw that his problem had already died on the troubled surface of her mind. There was an embarrassing minute of vague, alighted introductions, and then Harry followed the party inside and watched them disappear up the stairs. He went into the library and sat down on the big sofa. For an hour he watched the sun creep up the patterned folds of the chintz curtains. In the deep quiet, a trapped wasp buzzing on the inside of the window pane assumed the proportions of a clamor. From time to time another buzzing drifted down from upstairs, resembling several more larger wasps caught on larger window panes. He heard low footfalls, the clink of bottles, the clamor of pouring water. What had he and Roxanne done that life should deal these crashing blows to them? Upstairs there was taking place a living inquest on the soul of his friend. He was sitting here in a quiet room, listening to the plaint of a wasp, just as when he was a boy he had been compelled by a strict aunt to sit hour-long on a chair and atone for some misbehavior. But who had put him here? What ferocious aunt had leaned out of the sky to make him atone for what? About Kitty he felt a great hopelessness. She was too expensive. That was the irremediable difficulty. Suddenly he hated her. He wanted to throw her down and kick at her, to tell her she was a cheat and a leech, that she was dirty. Moreover, she must give him his boy. He rose and began pacing up and down the room. Simultaneously he heard someone begin walking along the hallway upstairs in exact time with him. He found himself wondering if they would walk in time until the person reached the end of the hall. Kitty had gone to her mother. God help her, what a mother to go to! He tried to imagine the meeting, the abused wife collapsing upon the mother's breast. He could not. That Kitty was capable of any deep grief was unbelievable. He had gradually grown to think of her as something unapproachable and callous. She would get a divorce, of course, and eventually she would marry again. He began to consider this. Whom would she marry? He laughed bitterly, stopped. A picture flashed before him, of Kitty's arms around some man whose face he could not see, of Kitty's lips pressed close to other lips in what was surely passion. God, he cried aloud. God, God, God! Then the pictures came thick and fast. The kitty of this morning faded. The soiled kimono rolled up and disappeared. The pouts and rages and tears all were washed away. Again she was Kitty Carr. Kitty Carr with yellow hair and great baby eyes. Ah, she had loved him. She had loved him. After a while he perceived that something was amiss with him, something that had nothing to do with Kitty or Jeff something of a different genre. Amazingly, it burst on him at last. He was hungry. Simple enough. He would go into the kitchen in a moment and ask the colored cook for a sandwich. After that, he must go back to the city. He paused at the wall, jerked at something round, and, fingering it absently, put it to his mouth and tasted it as a baby tastes a bright toy. His teeth closed on it. Ah! She left that damn kimono, that dirty pink kimono. She might have had the decency to take it with her, he thought. It would hang in the house like the corpse of their sick alliance. He would try to throw it away, but he would never be able to bring himself to move it. It would be like Kitty, soft and pliable, withal impervious. You couldn't move Kitty. You couldn't reach Kitty. There was nothing there to reach. He understood that perfectly. He had understood it all along. He reached to the wall for another biscuit, and with an effort pulled it out, nail and all. He carefully removed the nail from the center, wondering idly if he had eaten the nail with the first biscuit. Preposterous! He would have remembered. It was a huge nail. He felt his stomach. He must be very hungry. He considered, remembered. Yesterday he had had no dinner. It was the girl's day out, and Kitty had lain in her room eating chocolate drops. She had said she felt smothery and couldn't bear having him near her. 
He had given George a bath and put him to bed, and then lain down on the couch, intending to rest a minute before getting his own dinner. There he had fallen asleep, and awakened about eleven, to find that there was nothing in the ice-box except a spoonful of potato salad. This he had eaten, together with some chocolate drops that he found on Kitty's bureau. This morning he had breakfasted hurriedly downtown before going to the office. But at noon, beginning to worry about Kitty, he had decided to go home and take her out to lunch. After that there had been the note on his pillow. The pile of lingerie in the closet was gone, and she had left instructions for sending her trunk. He had never been so hungry, he thought. At five o'clock, when the visiting nurse tiptoed downstairs, he was sitting on the sofa, staring at the carpet. "'Mr. Cromwell?' "'Yes?' "'Oh, Mrs. Curtin won't be able to see you at dinner. She's not well. She told me to tell you that the cook will fix you something, and that there's a spare bedroom.' "'She's sick, you say?' "'She's lying down in her room. The consultation is just over.' "'Did they—did they decide anything?' "'Yes,' said the nurse softly. "'Dr. Jewett says there's no hope. "'Mr. Curtin may live indefinitely, "'but he'll never see again, or move again, or think. "'He'll just breathe.' "'Just breathe?' "'Yes.' "'For the first time the nurse noted that, "'beside the writing-desk, "'where she remembered that she had seen a line "'of a dozen curious round objects "'she had vaguely imagined to be "'some exotic form of decoration.' there was now only one. Where the others had been, there was now a series of little nail-holes. Harry followed her glance dazedly, and then rose to his feet. "'I don't believe I'll stay. I believe there's a train.' She nodded. Harry picked up his hat. "'Good-bye,' she said pleasantly. "'Good-bye,' he answered, as though talking to himself, and evidently moved by some involuntary necessity. He paused on his way to the door, and she saw him pluck the last object from the wall and drop it into his pocket. Then he opened the screen door, and, descending the porch steps, passed out of her sight. CHAPTER V After a while the coat of clean white paint on the Jeffrey Curtain house made a definite compromise with the suns of many Julys, and showed its good faith by turning gray. It scaled. Huge peelings of very brittle old paint leaned over backward like aged men practicing grotesque gymnastics, and finally dropped to a moldy death in the overgrown grass beneath. The paint on the front pillars became streaky. The white ball was knocked off the left-hand doorpost. The green blinds darkened, then lost all pretense of color. It began to be a house that was avoided by the tender-minded. Some church bought a lot diagonally opposite for a graveyard, and this, combined with the place where Mrs. Curtin stays with that living corpse, was enough to throw a ghostly aura over that quarter of the road. Not that she was left alone. Men and women came to see her, met her downtown, where she went to do her marketing, brought her home in their cars, and came in for a moment to talk and to rest, in the glamour that still played in her smile. But men who did not know her no longer followed her with admiring glances in the street. A diaphanous veil had come down over her beauty, destroying its vividness, yet bringing neither wrinkles nor fat. She acquired a character in the village. A group of little stories were told of her, how when the country was frozen over one winter so that no wagons nor automobiles could travel, she taught herself to skate so that she could make quick time to the grocer and druggist and not leave Geoffrey alone for long. It was said that every night since his paralysis she slept in a small bed beside his bed, holding his hand. Geoffrey Curtin was spoken of as though he were already dead. As the years dropped by, those who had known him died or moved away. There were but half a dozen of the old crowd who had drunk cocktails together, called each other's wives by their first names, and thought that Jeff was about the wittiest and most talented fellow that Marlowe had ever known. Now, to the casual visitor, he was merely the reason that Mrs. Curtin excused herself sometimes and hurried upstairs. He was a groan or a sharp cry borne to the silent parlor on the heavy air of a Sunday afternoon. 
He could not move. He was stone blind, dumb, and totally unconscious. All day he lay in his bed, except for a shift to his wheelchair every morning while she straightened the room. His paralysis was creeping slowly toward his heart. At first, for the first year, Roxanne had received the faintest answering pressure sometimes when she held his hand. Then it had gone, ceased one evening, and never come back. And through two nights Roxanne lay wide-eyed, staring into the dark and wondering what had gone, what fraction of his soul had taken flight, what last grain of comprehension those shattered, broken nerves still carried to the brain. After that, hope died. Had it not been for her unceasing care, the last spark would have gone long before. Every morning she shaved and bathed him, shifted him with her own hands from bed to chair and back to bed. She was in his room constantly, bearing medicine, straightening a pillow, talking to him almost as one talks to a nearly human dog, without hope of response or appreciation, but with the dim persuasion of habit, a prayer when faith has gone. Not a few people, one celebrated nerve specialist among them, gave her a plain impression that it was futile to exercise so much care, that if Geoffrey had been conscious, he would have wished to die, that if his spirit were hovering in some wider air, it would agree to no such sacrifice from her. It would fret only for the prison of its body, to give it full release. "'But you see,' she replied, shaking her head gently, "'when I married Geoffrey it was until I ceased to love him. But, was protested, in effect, you can't love that. I can love what it once was. What else is there for me to do? The specialist shrugged his shoulders and went away to say that Mrs. Curtin was a remarkable woman and just about as sweet as an angel. But, he added, it was a terrible pity. There must be some man, or a dozen, just crazy to take care of her. Casually, there were. Here and there someone began in hope, and ended in reverence. There was no love in the woman except, strangely enough, for life, for the people in the world, from the tramp to whom she gave food she could ill afford, to the butcher who sold her a cheap cut of steak across the meaty board. The other phase was sealed up somewhere in that expressionless mummy who lay with his face turned ever toward the light as mechanically as a compass needle, and waited dumbly for the last wave to wash over his heart. After eleven years he died in the middle of a May night, when the scent of the syringa hung upon the windowsill, and a breeze wafted in the shrillings of the frogs and cicadas outside. Roxanne awoke at two, and realized with a start she was alone in the house at last. Chapter 6 After that she sat on her weather-beaten porch through many afternoons, gazing down across the fields that undulated in a slow descent to the white and green town. She was wondering what she would do with her life. She was thirty-six, handsome, strong, and free. The years had eaten up Geoffrey's insurance. She had reluctantly parted with the acres to right and left of her, and had even placed a small mortgage on the house. With her husband's death had come a great physical restlessness. She missed having to care for him in the morning. She missed her rush to town, and the brief and therefore accentuated neighborly meetings in the butchers and grocers. She missed the cooking for two, the preparation of delicate liquid food for him. One day, consumed with energy, she went out and spaded up the whole garden, a thing that had not been done for years. And she was alone at night in the room that had seen the glory of her marriage, and then the pain. To meet Jeff again, she went back in spirit to that wonderful year, that intense, passionate absorption and companionship, rather than looked forward to a problematical meeting hereafter. She awoke often to lie and wish for that presence beside her, inanimate yet breathing, still Jeff. One afternoon, six months after his death, she was sitting on the porch, in a black dress which took away the faintest suggestion of plumpness from her figure. It was Indian summer, golden brown all about her, a hush broken by the sighing of leaves. Westward, a four o'clock sun dripping streaks of red and yellow over a flaming sky. Most of the birds had gone, 
only a sparrow that had built itself a nest on the cornice of a pillar kept up an intermittent cheeping varied by occasional fluttering sallies overhead roxanne moved her chair to where she could watch him and her mind idled drowsily on the bosom of the afternoon harry cromwell was coming out from chicago to dinner since his divorce over eight years before he had been a frequent visitor they had kept up what amounted to a tradition between them when he arrived they would go to look at jeff harry would sit down on the edge of the bed and in a hearty voice ask well jeff old man how do you feel today roxanne standing beside would look intently at jeff dreaming that some shadowy recognition of this former friend had passed across that broken mind but the head pale carven would only move slowly in its sole gesture toward the light as if something behind the blind eyes were groping for another light long since gone out these visits stretched over eight years at easter christmas thanksgiving and on many a sunday harry had arrived paid his call on jeff and then talked for a long while with roxanne on the porch he was devoted to her he made no pretense of hiding no attempt to deepen this relation she was his best friend as the mass of flesh on the bed there had been his best friend she was peace she was rest she was the past of his own tragedy she alone knew he had been at the funeral but since then the company for which he worked had shifted him to the east and only a business trip had brought him to the vicinity of chicago roxanne had written him to come when he could after a night in the city he had caught a train out they shook hands and he helped her move two rockers together how's george he's fine roxanne seems to like school of course it was the only thing to do to send him of course you miss him horribly harry yes i do miss him he's a funny boy he talked a lot about George. Roxanne was interested. Harry must bring him out on his next vacation. She had only seen him once in her life, a child in dirty rompers. She left him with the newspaper while she prepared dinner. She had four chops tonight and some late vegetables from her own garden. She put it all on and then called him, and sitting down together, they continued their talk about George. "'If I had a child,' she would say, Afterward, Harry, having given her what slender advice he could about investments, they walked through the garden, pausing here and there to recognize what had once been a cement bench or where the tennis court had lain. Do you remember? Then they were off on a flood of reminiscences, the day they had taken all the snapshots and Jeff had been photographed astride the calf, and the sketch Harry had made of Jeff and Roxanne lying sprawled in the grass, their heads almost touching. There was to have been a covered lattice connecting the barn studio with the house so that Jeff could get there on wet days. The lattice had been started, but nothing remained except a broken triangular piece that still adhered to the house and resembled a battered chicken coop. And those mint juleps. And Jeff's notebook. Do you remember how we'd laugh, Harry, when we'd get it out of his pocket and read aloud a page of material? And how frantic he used to get? wild he was such a kid about his writing they were both silent a moment and then harry said we were to have a place out here too do you remember we were to buy the adjoining twenty acres and the parties we were going to have again there was a pause broken this time by a low question from roxanne do you ever hear of her harry why yes he admitted placidly She's in Seattle. She's married again to a man named Horton, a sort of lumber king. He's a great deal older than she is, I believe. And she's behaving? Yes, that is, I've heard so. She has everything, you see. Nothing much to do except dress up for this fellow at dinner time. I see. Without effort, he changed the subject. Are you going to keep the house? I think so she said, nodding. I've lived here so long, Harry, it seemed terrible to move. I thought of trained nursing, but of course that'd mean leaving. I've about decided to be a boarding-house lady. 
Live in one? No, keep one. Is there such an anomaly as a boarding-house lady? Anyway, I'd have a negress and keep about eight people in the summer, and two or three, if I can get them, in the winter. Of course I'll have to have the house repainted and gone over inside. Harry considered. Roxanne, why, naturally you know best what you can do, but it does seem a shock, Roxanne. You came here as a bride. Perhaps, she said, that's why I don't mind remaining here as a boarding-house lady. I remember a certain batch of biscuits. Oh, those biscuits, she cried. Still, from all I heard about the way you devoured them, they couldn't have been so bad. I was so low that day, yet somehow I laughed when the nurse told me about those biscuits. I noticed that the twelve nail holes are still in the library wall where Jeff drove them. Yes. It was getting very dark now. A crispness settled in the air. A little gust of wind sent down a last spray of leaves. Roxanne shivered slightly. We'd better go in. He looked at his watch. It's late. I've got to be leaving. I go east tomorrow. Must you? They lingered for a moment just below the stoop, watching a moon that seemed full of snow float out of the distance where the lake lay. Summer was gone, and now Indian summer. The grass was cold, and there was no mist and no dew. After he left, she would go in and light the gas and close the shutters, and he would go down the path and on to the village. To these two, life had come quickly and gone, leaving not bitterness but pity. Not disillusion, but only pain. There was already enough moonlight when they shook hands, for each to see the gathered kindness in the other's eyes. End of The Lees of Happiness by F. Scott Fitzgerald